Здравствуйте. Здравствуйте, Алексей Леонидович. Здравствуйте, Ольга Борисовна. Ольга Борисовна, микрофончик выключен. И, 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 и. Коллеги, мы для качества связи должны что-то вырубать или оставим так, как есть, со звуком, допустим, или с изображением? Привет, Аркадий Михайлович. А, только микрофоны, когда будут выступ... выступать. Микрофоны пригласить, понятно. Угу, понятно. А, микрофон наш убери. Good afternoon to all from European time zones. Good evening for those in the eastern regions and good morning to all who just got up to join us. Welcome to the 16th International Conference on Thermal Analysis and Calorimetry in Russia. My name is Alexandra Khan, and I'm honored to be deputy chair of the conference. And I would like to ask the co-chair of the conference, the Dean of the Department of Chemistry of Moscow State University, Professor Stepan Nikolaevich Komakov, to say a few words to open the meeting. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for introducing me. And uh, it is my great pleasure to open this uh, conference. So unfortunately, as many of the conferences at, at least I was planning to attend, they are either canceled or turned to online version or postponed. So we have our conference online and I welcome you on behalf of the organizers uh, at this online event. Uh, so we have uh, three different organizers. So Moscow State University, Institute of General and Inorganic Chemistry and National University MISIS. So we all belong to different uh, state bodies because Moscow State University belongs directly to the government. Uh, University Mises belongs to the Ministry of Higher Education and Science and uh, Institute of General and Inorganic Chemistry. It also belongs to Ministry, but this is a Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, so we have a very broad program and I'm happy to tell you that so we have a lot of very uh, very interesting oral presentations uh, during uh, during our symposium. We have a complete book of abstract that is published, and we have uh, a special issue of uh, Russian Journal of Physical Chemistry devoted to the 16th uh, International Conference on Thermal Analysis and Calorimetry. So I hope that next year we definitely will meet uh, each other offline. Uh, because this is a very important thing in each conference. This is informal talks during coffee breaks, during welcome events, during uh, uh, conference dinners, where scientists from different areas, from different countries can meet together and speak in informally. So this is the basis for very successful uh, collaboration in science. So I hope that next year we will have all these uh, social events uh, at, uh, at the conference. Uh, so before giving back floor to Alexandra, I would like to say a few words to several people. I, I, I would like to, to read that, their names, not to forget anyone. Uh, so I would like first, I would like uh, first of all to thank uh, Konstantin Gavrichev, whom I know for, for many years, who is the uh, vice chairman of the conference, as well as Irina Uspenskaya from Moscow State University, Alexandro Kovran from, uh, from Mises University, and scientific secretary uh, Nikita Kovalenko. So they made a great effort to make this event successful and at least to have online, uh, online uh, event today. Then I would like to thank uh, members of pro uh, pro pro program committee that we are very active in uh, viewing and reading the thesis and uh, abstracts and uh, uh, 
uh, preparing them for publication as well as the papers in the Journal of uh, Physical Chemistry. So this is uh, Yekaterina Belova, uh, Mikhail uh, Varfolomeyev uh, from Kazan Federal University, uh, Natalia Konstantinova, uh, Kordakov Svetlana, Maximova Alexeya, Alex Apisha, uh, this is, uh, he is from France, uh, Fabricio Olgu, uh, Germany, uh, Hanna Hallstatter, Germany, and certainly Germany, and certainly I would like especially to thank uh, Alexander Zuban, who is responsible for all these technical aspects related to online translation. As you know, we have both Zoom uh, meeting here, and we also have online translation in the YouTube, YouTube. So all the lectures, conversations and uh, uh, discussions after the pl uh, plenary talks, they will leave uh, for, for years at the YouTube, uh, in, in YouTube. So again, I would like to, uh, to uh, wish you successful conference and I would like certainly to wish you good health and uh, uh, we, stay, we stay strong and we wait until all this global crisis related to COVID-19 will go away and we can meet, uh, meet together. So thank you very much and I give back floor to, uh, to Alexandra. Thank you. Before we start our plenary session, I should address some technical issues. First, I would like kindly to ask all participants except speakers to switch off your microphones during the talks to exclude possible extraneous noise. Secondly, the audience, the audience is invited to ask questions to the speaker at the end of the talk. In order to do so, please use Zoom chat option and type in word question. We will do our best to keep the order in which the questions appear, but we apologize in advance for any confusions that may occur. You can also write your question in chat. Your question will be read. Third, the conference is recorded and will be available on YouTube to allow all participants and larger audience to listen to the talks. The final version of the book of abstracts of the conference will be published by the end of this week, and the conference proceedings of full text papers will be published in special chapters of three issues of the Russian Journal of Physical Chemistry. The announcement will be appearing at the website later on. And now I would like to invite our first speaker today, Dr. Alexander Pesch, with his talk, Thermodynamic Properties of Solid and Liquid Oxides, using an integrated approach of DFT molecular, molecular dynamics and key experiments. Alex. Thank you very much. So I will share the screen. So is everything fine for the screen? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, thanks. First of all, a big thank you uh, for the invitation and the possibility to present some of my results and ongoing research on this symposium. I would have loved to come to Moscow for the first time, but uh, well, it's not, it's then for next year. So we will see. Uh, although we are now used to work by video, this is the first time that I give a full talk uh, over the net, so we will see how things go on in the next 45 minutes. So as I said, I will present to you in the next 45 minutes some results on thermodynamic properties of solid and liquid oxides using an integrated approach of DFT, molecular dynamics, and key experiments. Uh, it is obvious that I have not performed this work all alone. Uh, therefore, uh, before presenting the results, I want to thank a quite uh, a, a, long, a short list of colleagues. First of all, my colleagues here in Grenoble, Alain Pasturel, Noel Jacques, Joanna Nuta, and also Alexander Kwan at, at uh, National University uh, Mises in Moscow, with whom I had a lot of discussions on the topic. And then last but not least, uh, my postdoc, Guillaume Dufresne, who worked a lot on, especially on the lime oxygen system, together with Cecilia Alvarez, who is a master's student. And then um, uh, I will acknowledge financial support in the frame of the French R&D program, Cando de l'Energie, and uh, European R&D network, NanoSEM. 
and also computer resources at Greek RT and Grenoble. And not to forget a lot of discussions we had in the in the French national uh, collaborative network on thermodynamics, which is called Thermat HD. So the outline of the next 40 minutes of my talk is the following. I will start a brief introduction on why we should continue to work on thermodynamics of oxides. And uh, I will make a quick overview how thermodynamic properties were investigated in the past and what we can do differently in the 21st century. I'm convinced that we still need high quality thermodynamic data to advance uh, in the conquest and understand of old and new materials. And I will focus on the thermodynamic properties of alkaline earth oxides to start with, and then go over to uh, and more precisely on lime, magnesium oxide, and strontium oxides, which are the main oxides in this, in this field. And as a second example, I will present some results on alkaline oxides based on lithium, sodium, and potassium. The, these uh, uh, alkaline oxides are, are important in many fields, ranging from battery development in the case of lithium to biomass combust combustion in the case of no sodium and potassium. And, and the main characteristics of these of these alkaline uh, oxides is that they are really that, that there is not much e experimental data available because they are really tricky to measure. Uh, they are so reactive that it's not easy to get uh, very good experimental values. So maybe. What, what I will show you today can help to, 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 to get a better understanding how these systems uh, are working. And last but not least, I will show that the presented approach is not limited to oxides. No, first of all, I will, I will show a ternary system, sorry, uh, which is lime, alumina, boron oxide. Uh, this is some recent work we did on phase diagrams, but also including some dynamic work. Uh, so I initially changed a little bit the, the work from my abstract. In the abstract, I only wanted to pre present uh, lime, aluminica, uh, lime aluminica binary system. But here, I, I think it's more interesting to show the ternary system. And then in the, in the la last part, I will show uh, uh, calcium sulfur aluminate as a, as a sulf, uh, sulfate bearing system to show that the, the, the approach I will show you today is not limited to oxides only, but can be extended to, calfate, to sulfates, carbonates, chlorides, or other salt, uh, salt or oxygen salt systems. So why thermodynamics of oxides? Why should we still continue to work on that? First of all, because a lot of scientific areas are concerned. As an example for some basic work and fundamental understanding, one can cite earth science uh, and, and geology and planetology as represented here by the volcano and the, and the moon. Uh, thermodynamics can help us to gain fundamental understanding on phase formation, especially under extreme conditions, uh, as very high temperature and high pressure, uh, because they're very hard to, uh, to make in the lab. Uh, this concerns mainly silicates and aluminates of calcium magnesium, but with some additions of some multivalence elements such as iron, and titanium. And, and in, in the case of planetology, the starting point is always a complex gas phase at very high temperature, with, which through condensation becomes liquid and then solid. And, uh, and therefore, the, the, the reaction sequence is very interesting to, to investigate. And, and lastly, as the time horizon is geological, thermodynamic equilibrium can be assumed in, 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 in very, very often in many cases. The second field is more familiar as it concerns industrial applications of oxides. Uh, as I show in this slide here is building materials. And you see on the left is a, is a, a cement work plant to produce cement clinker. And on the right side, you see the use of concrete. This is a picture of Grenoble and a very famous tower here in Grenoble, which is one of the first buildings made of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, here, thermodynamics uh, is helping us uh, two ways. In, 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 on the left side, so on the on the on the uh, synthesis, it's a high temperature process. So uh, natural raw materials, limestone, clay, sand are mixed together, are ground and mixed together, and then uh, put into a high temperature rotary kiln where they react and make calcium silicates and aluminates. So it's clear that in the flame, which is uh, close to 16, 17, 1800 degrees Celsius, uh, uh, equilibrium is not so far off. So having good data is, is uh, very important in order to, to, to understand and to improve the process. 
on the right side is the is the um, the, the, as I said, the concrete thermodynamics here, it's not so much the high temperature, but it's more aqueous thermodynamics. So the, the cement is uh, re uh, mixed with water and it reacts. And here, uh, uh, again, the high quality data is needed because at least at room temperature or close to room temperature, thermodynamics alone is not governing the system. Uh, it's clear that a lot of phenomena in this uh, temperature range are kinetic. And it's good to always uh, to, to, to determine whether what you observe has a thermodynamic origin or a kinetic origin. So really good data can help us to, to, to improve uh, our understanding. And other industrial products uh, are shown here on the left side, metallurgical slags, uh, which are also used as building materials. But not only, some of them is still dumped uh, into, into nature because it's not used. So it's a shame that it's not used. I think we should do something with these metallurgical slags. And on the right side, glass uh, production. Uh, in this case, in both cases, the thermodynamic properties are important for the liquid state. So it's multi-component, high temperature. But then at room temperature, uh, when, when uh, the samples are cooled down, uh, everything is meter stable. So we have glasses, we have amorphous glasses, amorphous state. And, uh, and, and we want to have also high good quality data for these meter stable areas. And I will show a little bit later and come back to this point. So how can we determine experimentally the thermodynamic properties of oxides? Well, this is a very old story and started basically in the 19th century with the development or in parallel with the development of colorimeters. And in the case of oxides, basically we have two types of equipment. On the left side, we have a combustion colorimeter, a very old one. There are moderns also, you can, kill, but you can still buy them. And uh, here it's the important point that you react a metal with a certain amount of oxygen and you measure the heat upon reaction. And, uh, and so this gives you then the heat of formation of the, of the metal oxide. Uh, in the case of lime uh, or magnesia, it may be straightforward because uh, lime uh, CaO or MgO is formed. But in the case of systems where you can have a, a series of uh, multiple oxides, I, I think about titanium or, or other valence, high valence oxides, you may not end up with a single oxide. So it's very important to characterize uh, carefully your sample after reaction. And sometimes it's not even crystalline, but you get an amorphous. It's, so it's not always straightforward to get high quality data out of combustion colorimetry. On the right side, a solution colorimetry is then used if you have higher order oxides, because then you can refer them to the simple oxides that you measured before by combustion colorimetry. And, uh, Basically, you have two methods, either solution colorimetry at moderate temperature uh, using uh, borates or, or molybdates as a solvent, or you can use aqueous chemistry uh, using acids as a solvent. So this, with this equipment, normally you should get a nice value for the heat of formation, but still you would need the data for the temperature dependence. And so you have the two, basically two techniques. You have the, the low temperature adiabatic colorimetry, uh, one example on the left side uh, of a Russian equipment. There are also some American and, 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 and French equipments. But the one characteristic is that there aren't many around anymore of these uh, adiabatic colorimeters. And on the right side, you see a result from magnesium oxide, uh, basically from the few Kelvin up to room temperature, and you can derive then the, the, entropy, the entropy of the standard entropy at room temperature from this equipment. This equipment is very precise uh, from, a, from a measurement point of view. Uh, the, the main uh, critical point is the sample, and I will show you a little bit later a result on Lyme why this uh, point uh, is critical. Uh, when it goes to high temperature, basically, again, you have two, uh, one way of doing, which is the heat content measurements. So you measure H uh, from a temperature, a higher temperature, minus H at room temperature. So you can use two types of colorimeters, uh, either uh, a direct colorimetry, that means you start a sample from room temperature and you drop it in a colorimeter, which is heated. This is limited to 1500 uh, Celsius. 
if you want to go to higher temperature, you have to do it the other way around. You have to heat the sample up to a temperature from 1500 to 3000. And, and then you can drop it into a calorimeter at room temperature. The main difficulties here are the temperature measurements and the reaction of the sample with the crucibles or the vapor, vaporization effects. So again, the higher you go to temperature, the more difficult is the, the measurement. And last but not least, you also have uh, Gibbs energy-based measurements. So either uh, electromotive force, force measurements here on the left side or Newton diffusion mass spectrometry. In both cases, you measure activities. And from these acti activities, you can derive Gibbs energies and get temperature data uh, like this. So in the old times, what you did is then you use the data and you put it into compilations, thermodynamic compilations. And uh, on the left side, you, you see some of the books that you may have in your lab. Uh, you have the Janov books, you have the thermodynamic data from Barin and Knacke or, or the Gurvich compilation. And, and uh, the point is here that very often you have the tabulation, but you also have functions. Uh, let's say now for 30 years, we, we, we tend to put these data into thermodynamic databases electronically. And uh, the advantage is that you can use then directly the data with Gibbs energy minimizers. And with the Gibbs energy minimizers, you can, uh, you can do thermodynamic uh, calculations. And this is, uh, so in the compilations, you basically have uh, stoichiometric phases, but then you can also use the, the data to, uh, to do Kalfa type modeling. And I show just an example here where you have the magnesium oxide, aluminum oxide system. And, and, and you see that the spinel phase or the liquid phase have rather complex models in order to, to describe their composition dependency correctly. Uh, so this is, the, let's say, the, the old way up to now, how we do things. And, and now it becomes the important new stuff. We can do calorimetry uh, by, uh, by doing uh, work with uh, numerical calculations, which is, was not possible before. And I also consider this as a numerical calorimetry, because in, in real calorimetry, you, you measure the heat of a, a compound with respect to the constituents. And in, in, uh, in uh, the numerical calorimetry, you do the same. The only thing what you do is you do the calculations. So you calculate the, the internal energy of the compounds and the constituents. And by difference, you also get the energy information. How do we do this? Well, the, the, the magic word is DFT, so density functional theory. So you compute the electronic structure of the of matter and to get the ground state properties of the system. And one of the ground state properties if the, is the ground state energy. Uh, but you also get the, the, the crystal structure, the, the stable crystal structure and the, the lattice parameters. And to do this, we start from the von Oppenheim approximation where we consider only the electron to move, the electrons to move and the nuclei are fixed. And, and, and then we try to solve the, the Cohn-Sharm equation, which is here. And in these Cohn-Sharp equations, you have what is called the exchange functional. And classically, we have the, the, what is called the LDA exchange functional and the GGA exchange functional. But more recently, since uh, 2015, there is what we call the meta GGA, which is called SCAN, strongly constrained and appropriately normed semi-local density functional. And all calculations I will show in this presentation have been performed with this SCAN functional. And the idea is to show you that the, the results we get are pretty impressive and that in the future we can use these type of calculations to derive thermodynamic data for, for oxides also. So how we do we do this? We start from the, from the initial structure. So we have an initial uh, density of the electrons and, and, and then we, we uh, try to resolve the Cohn-Sharm equation and then we get a new density. And this is an iterative approach uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the atoms are moved and the electrons are calculated until I get the minimum of the energy. And when the, the energy is minimized and the, 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 um, the forces on the ions are zero, I consider that I reached equilibrium. And so then gives the, so this gives the total energy of zero K. But when we go to high temperature properties, we, we need uh, a lattice theory. 
And, and there we compute the, the phonon spectrum, as you can see on the right for CAO. And from this phonon spectrum and the energies of the phonons of the lattice vibration, we can calculate the, the Helmholtz free energy uh, in the harmonic approximation as given by this formula. And from this Helmholtz free energy, using classical thermodynamics, I can calculate then the entropy and the, the uh, heat capacity and constant volume. And, uh, and uh, if I want the heat capacity at the constant pressure, then I just have to calculate a series of, uh, of uh, Helmholtz free energies at different volumes. And like this, I can calculate the Gibbs energy. And from the Gibbs energy, uh, as given here, the, the second derivative of the temperature, I can calculate the, the heat capacity. So if I then have the heat capacity, uh, I, I can either make a polynomial fit as it was done in the past, or what is more and more done in the Calvert community is use an Einstein model, where we have one Einstein temperature or multiple Einstein temperatures uh, to, to fit the, the, the heat capacity. And, and it's clear that at high temperature, uh, this is only valid at low temperatures. So if we want to go to high temperature, we need some extra terms in order to get good agreement with the, with the experimental values. And so if we sum up everything together, then we can get the Gibbs energy. And so first of all, the heat of formation, uh, we calculate it at 0k. And I get an example here for lime. Look at 0k, we have CaO minus the energy of 0k for calcium minus half the energy of oxygen gas. And uh, so this gives me the energy of formation at 0k. And then because I have lattice contribution even at 0k, which is called the so-called zero point energy, I have to do the same with the calculated zero point energies that I got from the lattice calculations. And then as I have the CP from zero to room temperature, I can calculate the delta H from zero to 298 which is just the heat content from, uh, in this case, lime, calcium, and oxygen gas. And if I sum up all the three contributions, I get the heat of formation. And the heat of conformations I will present later in this, in, in this talk are all calculated in this way. And when it comes to the liquid phase in the Calvert community, uh, which becomes more and more the standard, is uh, the so-called two-state model, where I consider that the liquid phase has two contributions, an amorphous phase and the liquid phase. And, and from this amorphous phase, so amorphous solid-like phase, uh, when I go up at high temperature, the liquid uh, contribution uh, takes over and becomes more important. And this is just a mathematical uh, way of, uh, of uh, treating this uh, description of the liquid phase. I will not go into details. I will show you some examples later in the, in the presentation. So after this rather uh, long introduction, I will come to, to show you some examples. And I start with the alkaline earth oxides. And uh, I, I will only show uh, the, the single oxides, the magnesium oxides, calcium oxide, and strontium oxide. I won't go and discuss peroxides. So this, the structure is pretty, pretty simple. It's a cubic structure, uh, M minus 3M, a lattice uh, space group. And here I will show you uh, the calculated results uh, compared to the measured results. On the left side, you see magnesium oxides, and you see a very, very good agreement between the work done by uh, Gmelian in 69 here in Grenoble and, uh, and uh, work by Watanabe in 93. And the calculated entropy is basically exactly the entropy that, uh, that Gmelian derived from his measurements. So that was very satisfying. And so we said, OK, let's, let's try uh, calcium oxide and strontium oxide. And you see, in calcium oxide, we, we have a shift uh, the values from Gmelin, which are these the crosses, are, are way below the, the value we calculate. And, and therefore, the calculated entropy uh, of uh, 40.2 joules per mole in Kelvin is, is smaller, is higher than what uh, Gmelin derived from his data. So the question is, are our calculations wrong? Is the method not good enough to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to describe the, the data for lime oxide? or may the problem be in the measurement. So then we compare to strontium and you see on the left side, strontium is again, basically right uh, on, on the line and with a very good agreement with Gmelin. 
So if you come back now to to the to Limox, so what what can be the origin? And and, and there uh, it, it can be sometimes tricky when you go to the old literature, because uh, in in the paper uh, in '69, Gmelin re, uh, referred for the sample preparation to a paper which was in in the f French uh, journal uh, Contre du des Académies des Sciences. And, and if you read that paper, you realize that the lime sample he used had a porosity of 30%. So he, he made a sample at very high temperature and quenched it and re-annealed it. And, and, and the sample really had 30% of porosity. So, and, and, and there you can ask, and this was not the case for the magnesium oxide and strontium oxide he used. So I'm, uh, unless uh, we, we somebody remeasured uh, the sample more carefully, I'm I'm more convinced about the calculations uh, than uh, than the measurements. Why that? If you look at the standard heat of formation calculated, also by the same approach, you see that the value for lime using DFT and phonon calculations is exactly what is uh, measured uh, and 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 compiled in the Janov in the Gorovic uh, compilations. So there's really an extremely good agreement. The agreement is a little bit less good for magnesium oxide and strontium oxide, where we have errors which are less than 2%, uh, but still it's reasonable. If you compare that with, uh, with the old GGA-derived uh, uh, calculations, which are way off and which very often have to be corrected manually in order to get an agreement. Here, the scan the functional as employed in, in my calculations gives directly a very good result. When it comes to the high temperature part, you see that uh, the agreement, so if we extrapolate uh, to, to very high temperature, is extremely good. Uh, so the DFT derived calculations are good, uh, let's say, until uh, 1300 degrees Kelvin. Upper, roughly two, or, or let's say 1800. It's roughly half or two thirds of the melting point. And what about higher temperature? And you see here these, these blue dots here. And these blue dots are calculated by up initial DFT calculations. So we used again the scan functional and, and do molecular dynamics calculation. And it's clear that it's very, very time consuming in terms of calculation because uh, you have a lot of atoms. In order to make it correctly, you have to have at least three to 400 atoms in the cell. And, and therefore, if you do a full up initial calculation, it's, it's not straightforward in terms of time. But it gives you excellent results. As you see by the three points, they are basically within the experimental uncertainty. If you use classical uh, molecular dynamics, you see that the agreement is not so good. Still reasonable, but not, not so good as the molecular dynamics. So that is probably one of the, the first conclusions. If you have a system for which you don't have any data, uh, up initial molecular dynamics may be a good way of calculating things and, and give you an idea. But what about the liquid phase now? So we have a nice uh, data set for the solid phase. And then when you look at the literature, you see it's a mess. So here you, I, I plotted just three versions of the, of the liquid phase. You see uh, Janaf, uh, which uh, was uh, taken as a reference for the fact uh, pure substance database. And they assumed a CP of 63 uh, joule per moles in Kelvin. And a melting point, uh, which is here, which is uh, at 2,800 uh, Kelvin. SGTE, in their database, they assumed a much higher melting point, around 3,100 something. And also, they assumed a much higher, uh, higher heat, uh, uh, heat capacity in liquid phase of 83 uh, joules per mole in Kelvin. So the question is now, which is the good melting point? which is the good CP in the liquid, which is the good heat of fusion, and where is the glass transition? So four questions in principle you should always ask in wh when you have uh, uh, an extrapolation of the liquid phase down to room temperature. And so in, in, in this case, it's not straightforward because you cannot make a, a, an amorphous uh, lime sample. It's physically impossible. And even in calculation, it's impossible. We did not succeed in, in uh, up initial molecular dynamics calculation to, to, to go down to room temperature. So it's impossible to make a, an amorphous uh, lime sample. 
However, what we did, we can calculate the time temperature. And so this is done by classical thermodynamics, uh, sorry, classical molecular dynamics. But we checked the values also by uh, up in issue for some points. And you see, we confirm the higher CP of the liquid, which is around 80 joules, 83 joules per Kelvin, which is the one which is also favored by uh, in the Gurwitch uh, compilation. So here, clearly, the assumption or the estimation by uh, by Janaf is wrong, and and it, it should be corrected. Uh, this, by the way, was more or less confirmed also for magnesium oxide in a recent paper by a Vienna group, which also found a higher value in uh, in uh, in the CP. And then the diffusion also was measured recently uh, at around uh, 3,200 Kelvin, and again by calculation. We confirmed this value, uh, this higher value. Our calculated value is at 3,170, so very close to the value they, they measured. And the last but not least, the, the heat of fusion is around 81 kilojoules per uh, mole, which is, means that you have an entropy of fusion of 25 joules per mole and Kelvin. Which is also an estimation done in the Gurvich compilation, and I think this is, the, or we think this is the right one. So using now this new CAO, what we did, we did the Kalfat uh, type assessment of the lime oxygen system, and this is just to show you that it perfectly matches the experimental values, which, uh, well, I didn't plot it, but uh, you can trust me, they are, they are here, the liquid solubility in, in pure calcium, and here you get the melting point. And that's something that's probably worthwhile just to discuss for one minute. The melting point we calculate is the congruent melting point, but this one is something that you never can measure, because the the, the melting point depends on the on the oxygen partial pressure, and in pure uh, the, so the congruent melting point is 3,222, and here the assessed one in uh, one bar of oxygen is 2,221.7, and when you go to lower oxygen partial pressures, you get a lower value. So therefore, always be careful when you when you trust the melting points of very high materials that the oxygen partial pressure may be a, 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 a tricky parameter to, to control experimentally, and, and therefore the, the values should be taken with care. So the next topic I want to discuss is alkali oxides. And basically, I, I, I will discuss three uh, structural types, or three groups. The first group is uh, the, the alkali-2 oxide. And, and then you have the, the peroxide, uh, Li202, Na2O2, K2O2, and the, the, the superoxide, Li02, Na2O2, KO2. And for example, in room temperature uh, under air conditions, so 0.21 of oxygen, only this peroxide is a stable uh, uh, one. The data is very, there is not much data in the literature. This is because it's very, very complicated to measure. Here is uh, one example is the one for lithium two oxide. And the calculated uh, value by DFT phonon is, is given here. And you see the agreement at low temperature is very good. And we have some discrepancy here uh, starting from 600. And it's clear that uh, because the melting point is around uh, around 1100, it's clear that the, the DFT uh, phonon calculations are only good up to 5600K. So I would say uh, starting from here, uh, it may be better to follow the experimental values. And you, see, you can see that here also, if you have uh, heat content, that you start to derive from the heat contents. But overall, the agreement is good. Uh, this is also uh, this is also uh, uh, given by the fact that we get a nice value for the heat of formation. Here you see the calculated one. Uh, so it's at room temperature, corrected with uh, zero point energy and heat content. And you see we are basically in very good agreement with two of the of the reported values for lithium two oxide two. We get a, a good agreement at the at the room temperature, and, and then we deviate. Uh, maybe our calculation, maybe the experiments. Again, experiments are very tricky in this case, but they are very very reactive. Our calculated heat of formation is right in the middle between the two uh, experimental values. 
another interesting feature of the of the calculation is that you also can calculate the gas species. And I did that again with the scan functional and, and the gas uh, species. And you see the agreement is very, very uh, not bad. Uh, for, for pure lithium, we basically find the same value that you get in the Janov compilation. For lithium oxide, uh, at least we have the right tendency. Uh, we found 50 and the experimental value was 84 plus minus 21. So the error bar is pretty large. And for uh, Li2O, the value is rather negative. And again, we, we find the right tendency. So I think <coughs> the proposed method may be also a good way to check uh, guess, uh, guess data if you find it in the literature in order to see if the order of magnitude is correct. When it comes to sodium oxide, there is only one, no, there are two heat content measurements, and that's all. So again, the heat of formation that we calculate is in very, very good agreement with the, with the literature values, the measured values. <coughs> and then comes the, the, the starting point why we started this work on, on alkali oxide is to have and to check the data on potassium oxide. And there you see that the, the estimated data in the, in, in the literature, which is based on, on, on Janov, is, is uh, not so bad for the heat of formation. So we have an error of, let's say, 3 to 4%. But the entropy derived from the low temperature heat capacity measurements are really completely different. So they're much uh, higher in the case of, uh, in, in both cases which may end up in the, in the end, give you the same, uh, the same uh, Gibbs energy, at least at room temperature, because both balance a little bit, but when it goes then to higher temperature, uh, it, it may give different values. So now these values can be used to, to make a full uh, Kalfert assessment to see how this behaves in the multi-component system. So the next example I would give is the lime uh, alumino uh, boride system. So in this system, uh, again, not much uh, information in the literature. There is one isothermal section uh, at 800 uh, degrees. And there are three compounds reported in the literature. Two compounds, uh, calcium Al2B2O7 and calcium AlBO4 which are reported in the high temperature isothermal section and one compound, which is a natural uh, occurring uh, um, mineral called the uh, Yohadi light. Uh, it is not available. Uh, there's no thermodynamic data available. It's not even in the phase diagram. So from a structural point of view, there are also different. <coughs> the, the two on the left, the aluminum coordination is ALO4. So they have four co coordinated aluminum in the structure. On the right side, the aluminum is six coordinated. And therefore, the authors in the literature who said the investigated said it must maybe be a pressure uh, stabilized compound. So only available at, at high pressure uh, due to this uh, peculiar peculiar coordination of aluminum atoms of all six. <coughs> so we started the experimental work. So as I said before, on the left side, you see uh, uh, the isothermal section from the experiments at 800 degrees Celsius. On the right side, you see uh, one calculator from the fact search database. And overall, the two compounds are there. But what you see is a really strange low temperature eutectic on the lime rich side. And we said it, it's not possible because the starting point of the study was to work uh, with the system in building uh, material sectors of really lime rich. And we said, if you want to have uh, something correct, we cannot, we can't leave this low temperature eutectic. It must be an artifact of the, of the modeling. So we did the calculation <coughs> and from the heat capacity, uh, not much a surprise. Uh, the dotted line is the neumann kopp rule, so the sum of lime, alumina, and boron oxide. And you see that basically for these two compounds, 
we uh, we get the uh, Neumann copy behavior. So no surprise on that. But then if we go to the to the natural occurring uh, compound, it's a little bit below, not much, but a little bit below. But the big surprise came when we looked at the heat formation and the delta S with respect to the oxides. And you see that the heat of formation com com compared to the fact search database are much less negative. And that in the contrast, the delta S is much higher, much more positive. So these, at least the two first compounds with the ALO4 structure are entropy stabilized. That means the Gibbs energy becomes more than negative when the temperature goes up. And uh, despite the fact that the delta Cp with respect to the, to the basic oxides is almost zero. So it's clearly that the low temperature part from zero to room temperature have, have a big influence on these values. And, and, and uh, the, the third one, so the natural occurring has a negative entropy of formation. So apparently, if you have OLO6 in the structure, <laughs> You, um, you, you get a completely different behavior in terms of entropy. So if you produce now Gibbs energies out of these data and, and, and try to calculate, you see that this so supposed to be a stable only at pressure compound is stable at 25 degrees Celsius. And if you calculate then it decomposes at uh, let's say around 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. At that high temperature, you really find what is uh, known from the literature. So it's clearly that the, the so-called high pressure only compound does exist at room temperature, so at, at, at low temperature. So it's really a stable phase under normal conditions. <coughs> so we also uh, did some experimental work in order to determine the, the liquidus relations. And it's clear, you can see, uh, the, the low temperature compound doesn't exist uh, because uh, it's, it's not um, stable at high temperature. But with these two compounds, uh, ternary compounds, uh, they ha uh, have some associated reactions. And now everything is there to make a full Kalfan assessment of these systems if everybody is, uh, somebody's interested in it. So last but not least, uh, it's the calculation of the calcium sulfur illuminate. This is a very important compound in new cements because it's highly reactive towards water. And again, no, uh, no, uh, only limited amount of thermodynamic data was available. So we calculated the structure, the ground state properties. We did the phonon calculations. And here, just to show you, uh, you see the entropy of formation uh, with respect to the reaction given above. And our calculation, which is on the right, is in very good agreement with the uh, net entropy of solution measurement by acid dissolution by Costa at early the 70s. But all the other subsequent data is much more negative and can be now discarded in the in the in the discussion. Uh, there was even some positive value which can also be discarded. So we can now really assure that the value should be in this ballpark and not like this. So my conclusions. So thermodynamic data for oxide are still important for many fields and applications, as I've shown you, uh, for fundamental science, but also for applications. And I think the theoretical tools are now mature to generate high quality data. Uh, DFT calculations using the scan functional is 0k. And then when you add lattice, uh, lattice uh, dynamics, you can have uh, properties at higher temperature. And when it comes to very high temperature, Apinesia molecular dynamics really gives you interesting results uh, with the drawback that computers are still not uh, fast enough to, to get the results quickly. So you still have to wait, uh, to wait for, for a week or, or sometimes a month to get a result. But things improve in the future. And I, I think this can be uh, then uh, a, a good way of, of generating new data. The progress in theory and the experiments are both important. <coughs> in the theory, we can use that it for systems for which experimental conditions are difficult to, to, to install. 
as I've shown for the alkali oxides, uh, which are so reactive uh, with respect to CO2 and water vapor, uh, it may be much better to do calculations uh, than doing the experiments. And, uh, and we tried that. We tr tried now for one and a half year to get something out of it and still haven't succeeded to get something reasonable out. So it, it, it's really uh, sometimes calculations are quicker. But experiments are still very important, especially to check calculations and then also to, to, for systems in which calculations are really too complicated. For example, in solid solutions uh, or in, in, in compounds with partial occupancy, uh, it's much faster to, to do the experiment than to do the calculations, if the sample uh, synthesis is possible. And I think my, at least my focus in the future will be modeling on of meter stable phases, liquids, and especially liquid oxides below the melting point. It can be by ab initio molecular dynamics. And, uh, and, and then they do call for two-state model in order to get multi-component systems. But it's also important in solid solutions, uh, ranges in composition areas where we cannot get any experimental data. But the models need input values. I think there, this is very important to continue also this work on modeling of meter-stable phases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Now, questions are welcomed. Um, I would like to ask audience again to write what question in the chat if there are any questions. No questions? Okay, um, I probably have one. Alex, can you go to the slide um, with lithium oxide? Lithium oxide, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, what is, there is a kind of a jump between 51 John and uh, 78 Fan to think about room temperature. Is there any, what is the mismatch about it? I don't know where the jump comes from. It's just, I, I think it's just a measurement error. Ah, okay. Because uh, uh, fun just started at room temperature, mm -hmm. well, probably a little bit below room temperature. And so potentially the low temperature part is not good. And, and things improve and then, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, there is a question from Igor Abrikosov. Igor, Professor Abrikosov. Yes, yes uh, Alexander, thank you very much for an excellent talk. Very interesting. Uh, I, I understand that the question may be, uh, uh, yeah. Is there any hope that uh, thermodynamics can be measured uh, at high pressure? So what about high pressure? You, you said that oxides are extremely important uh, in geoscience and high pressure physics, and I fully agree on that. Uh, any hope of getting thermodynamic data at high pressure? I, I think uh, using up initial molecular dynamics, you, you can uh, calculate pressure yeah. dependence. Yeah. But again, it will take a, a, a lot of computer power to do so. Because no, you have no, to do no it at multiple. No way to doing it experimentally. Ah, experimentally, there are experiments, but they are limited to, to a certain amount of pressure and uh, and they are also very tricky to measure because you, you, you very often you have uh, you have uh, diamond pistons and then you measure and it, it's it's really uh, at, at moderate pressures you can measure in pressure cells uh, DC measurements in pressure cells but if it comes to very high pressure it's tricky. Again, you can probably make the samples uh, and then and then uh, if you have the samples quenched. In this high pressure state, you can measure the, the, the heat of formation and, and thermodynamic properties, but really directly measure in the high pressure state. I think crystalline properties, so the crystal structure and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, lattice parameters, this you can do. And this has been done. There's a lot of work in the literature, but then you, you can compare that to calculations, but really measuring high, high 
So, I mean, dynamic data is complicated. Okay. Uh, more questions? No. If that is not the case, then we should. Oh, there is a comment from Irina Spenska. Will you say it yourself? Uh, okay, I should read. Um, she writes, thank you, Alex, for uh, very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, okay, we should thank the speaker. And uh, we're now moving to the second talk, which is which will be given by Professor Grabri Kosov. And it will be thermal analysis from, oh, pardon. Yes, the thermal analysis from first principles, fundamental changes and practical applications. Uh, okay. Um, we are a little bit ahead of time. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to. Okay, I just want to make sure that you see my presentation uh, in a presentation mood. mood. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on the place and uh, your time zone. Uh, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be invited and it's an honor to give a presentation at, uh, at this meeting. Of course, I am uh, very... Uh, it's a sad story that uh, we have to go online instead of, uh, of a true physical meeting. Uh, but it's it's nice to see my colleagues uh, at least on uh, on Zoom, and uh, I'll do my best uh, to uh, to present to you our results, our recent results on uh, the way how we do ab initial calculations uh, for uh, for to determine thermal properties. Uh, the work was done in collaboration with uh, Alena Ponomareva, Maxim Belov, Ekaterina Smirnova, uh, Kosta Karavaev, uh, Kirill Sednov, Babur Mohamed, uh, Mohamedov, and with, uh, with our chair, uh, Alexander Kwan. And it's a collaboration between uh, my university in Sweden, in Shopping University, and uh, uh, National University of Science and Technology, MISIS. Uh, I would like to, uh, to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, just trying to move my slides, yeah. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues uh, who uh, also contributed to the results, which I'm going to present and to show today. Uh, members of my group at Linköping University, David Sangamani, Johan Klanberg, Bjorn Aling, Sergei Simak, David Gandina, Uli Helman, and, uh, and Nina Shulumba. Uh, my presentation is uh, devoted to uh, several subjects. Uh, I will uh, give a little introduction, short introduction on first principle simulations, basically focusing on simulation of solution phases. Uh, I can save some time uh, due to the excellent presentation by, by, by previous speaker. Uh, I will also show some examples. Uh, talk about theoretical description of thermodynamic and mechanical properties of multi-component <coughs> body-centered cubic iron chromium-based alloys. Uh, I'll show uh, how theoretical uh, calculations can be suitable for understanding uh, diffusion, and in particular, uh, I'll present superionic uh, like uh, mass transport in BCC titanium. Uh, I will focus on model techniques which uh, have been developed in wind chopping for simulations at finite temperature, the temperature dependent effective potential method. And I will uh, give the last story is about mixing entities of alloys with dynamical instability because this uh, subject I consider is of uh, very high importance uh, for thermodynamic community. <clears throat> uh, I hope I have time to conclude. Let me start with a, a graph or the, uh, the picture, which uh, many of you have already seen uh, many, many times, uh, because we are talking uh, systematically about multi-scale approach for materials modeling. Uh, there we start with quantum mechanical simulations at uh, relatively small uh, system sizes. Uh, then uh, to go to larger system sizes, we have to coarse grain our system, we have to get rid of electrons. Uh, so we go to thermodynamic models. 
uh, and when they go to uh, uh, to higher level models, uh, finally ending up in uh, doing simulations for our target uh, object, like uh, for example, uh, the nuclear reactor of the next of the next generation. Uh, the idea is, of course, that uh, we can uh, in all at all these steps. Uh, parameters needs to be uh, needs to be uh, presented, and then in very many cases, the parameters are taken uh, from the blue sky. Uh, they often uh, they sometimes available experimentally, but it's very often that uh, experimental information is limited, is not complete. Uh, and uh, what I am going to argue uh, that uh, theoretical calculations can be used to get these parameters, and this can be done with uh, density functional theory. I said that many of you have seen this picture several times before, and we are talking about a multi-scale approach for four years. Uh, and uh, giving this time, the approach uh, should be actually already working at the engineering, not just research level, and it still doesn't. And one reason why, uh, why, uh, why we have uh, challenges in going all the way from quantum mechanical calculations to device simulations uh, is the fact that we are using parameters, which are most often calculated at zero temperature. I'm very happy to see in the previous talk that uh, people start to, to include temperature effects at present, and this is very important. And for me, this is a key uh, to get a proper parameters for high level models, one should do simulations at low level models at the conditions where parameters are going to apply. It is a little bit meaningless to calculate zero temperature elastic constants of the material and use it in simulations of the property and the performance of the materials at 1000 degrees Celsius. Uh, I will. Uh, the, the main part of my presentation will be devoted to, uh, to um, illustrating this issue and to describing uh, what tools we are using and what tools we are, have developed and how, how these simulations can be carried out nowadays. Still, I start with uh, something very, very simple the basic idea behind the density functional theory. Uh, we know that all materials consist of atoms, atoms consist of atoms and electrons. Electrons are moving on roughly spherical orbits around the atoms. Uh, when atoms uh, form solid, um, uh, the inner electrons feel very little, but the outermost electrons can leave their respective atoms and they form bonds which keep atoms together. Uh, now we have to remember that electrons are quantum mechanical objects. They are never particles, no waves, they are both. Uh, and uh, the proper parameter, the proper uh, value to characterize uh, the behavior of electrons is electron wave function, which is not observable. The observable quantity is electron density. And uh, this is the basic of density functional theory. But knowing the electron density, you can predict and determine all other properties of the materials like lattice parameters, mixing entities, uh, the properties which are relevant for the subject of the present talk. And of course, density functional theory uh, was formulated uh, in the 60s, in uh, 64, 65. First papers were published by Hohenberg, Kohn, Kohn and Shem. Uh, and, um, the equation which we solve is uh, roughly presented in, in this graph. It looks very much like Schrodinger equation, uh, but electrons are moving in an effective potential created by uh, nucleus and all other electrons. Uh, in the theory, and it's very important to understand that density functional theory, we say, which is a theory, uh, which is fully proved uh, on the basis of, uh, uh, of two theorems. Uh, uh, there are, of course, approximation in practical applications of this theory. And the three cycles of approximations are related to the way how the one electron potential is defined, how uh, the equation is actually solved, because our computers don't like differential equations, so we have to expand our wave functions in a basis set, and different basis sets are used, uh, and this gives uh, rise to a this is an origin of all the zoo of electronic structure codes available now. But in addition to electrons, we do have atoms, we do have nucleus. 
And the low density functional theory transforms um, a, a multi electron unsolvable problem to a one electron problem. The amount of nucleus are still there. And for the mole of, uh, uh, of your material, there are 10 power 24 nucleus. So strictly speaking, you, do, you still do have 10 power 24 power variables in your equation to solve. And this is, uh, this is what, what, what uh, I will refer in the remainder of this talk as a structural complexity. And this is what we have to address to make our problem solvable. Before I move to, uh, to this issue, I would just like to underline another, another important point. that density functional theory is a constantly developing theory. It is a theory which is alive. It is a theory which uh, always improves basic approximation, especially in terms of the one electron potential. So the previous speaker focused a lot on the development of a scan functional. Uh, there are also other approximations uh, like dynamical mean field theory, LDA plus U hybrid functionals, which allow us to produce uh, data with higher and higher accuracy. But as I said today, I'm going to focus on the structural complexity. So I'm going to talk about uh, this circle of approximation, how it deals with, uh, with many atoms analysis. And uh, originally, uh, the theory was uh, considered and developed uh, for the case of ordered compounds. So when we have a perfect periodic order between, uh, say, red and blue atoms in this particular case, if we do have this periodic order, we can define the unit cell. And then we can make Fourier transform and remove the rest of the crystal and solve our problem for the unit cell. And this is very, very important. Because the solution of uh, differential equations, uh, which we transform to linear algebra, expanding our wave function to the basis set, scales as an n cube with a number of atoms in the unit cell. Basically, for one, for two atoms in the unit cell, it takes eight times longer to solve the problem than for one atom in the unit cell. And that's why it's getting pretty much complicated to include, to treat complex systems. Okay, so these are ordered compounds, but we do know that, uh, and especially in, in, in thermodynamic community, the solution phases are, are obviously very important. And in this case, uh, we cannot define a unit cell because the periodic, uh, the periodic distribution of atoms uh, is broken. Translation of symmetry is broken. There are two techniques which are currently used to address the problem in the solution phases. The first one is a supercell method, where you take a system as large as possible, introduce periodic boundary condition, and solve your problem for the big, big, big unit cell, which we call supercell. Of course, it is very important to understand that you cannot have an ad hoc distribution of atom, or you better don't have ad hoc distribution of atom in your supercell. There are very intelligent techniques like special quasi-random structure methods suggested by Alex Sunger in 90s. Uh, so you can dis design in, uh, the supercells intelligently, so you don't have to average between different supercells, but you have answer from calculating your properties just for one supercell. Still, calculations are extremely time consuming because you have to treat large number of atoms. And uh, as we have already pointed out before, uh, the computational effort scale as n cube. There is an additional method uh, or alternative method for treating the solution phases, which is called coherent potential approximation. Uh, the idea of this method uh, is to, instead of doing supercell, uh, to find an effective atom. Basically, you substitute your disordered distribution of atoms by an ordered distribution of effective atoms, uh, which the properties of which should, should determine uh, or describe the properties of your original solid solution components on the average. You have to find the proper quantity which you have to average. Now I'm moving from uh, red and blue to, to, to yellow and blue. Uh, I'm considering a solid solution, A, B solid solution. And when I introduce my uh, effective atoms, my green atoms, and I solve very uh, well proven, mathematically proven equations uh, in terms of the so called Green's functions. But the physical meaning of these equations is very simple. Uh, you assume that you add one A component in this effective medium, say, if you consider equiatomic alloy, you add one A component, 
you add one B component. And on the average, the system of these A and B impurities in your effective medium should give you the same properties as your effective medium. Of course, if it's not a uh, non uh, equilatomic alloy, you have to weight it with concentration. So, this is the basic idea behind uh, uh, the technique. So, both uh, supercell technique and coherent potential pro approximations have uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Supercell technique is very accurate, it can be realized with basically every electronic structure code available now uh, on the market. Uh, Coherent potential approximation requires special programming and has additional problems. For example, you cannot treat the problem of lattice relaxation. So at this point, atoms are sitting at the ideal position, which may be a severe limitation. However, it is very, very fast. And I'll show the application of uh, these methodologies first in uh, understanding the effect of multi-component alloying uh, with different impurities uh, on uh, the properties of iron chromium alloys. The example of iron chromium alloys is very interesting because this is a base for many important industrial steels uh, and in particular for nuclear reactors. Uh, it is known that uh, steels with up to 10% of chromium show enormous stability, uh, very high resistance to irradiation, uh, to swelling, uh, and, and other very important properties. Uh, however, for the next generation nuclear reactors, we need, uh, which are supposed to operate at, at, at uh, more extreme conditions, uh, you have to ensure that, uh, that your alloys uh, uh, have better properties. And one way of going and designing new steels is multi-component alloy. Obviously, experimental studies of iron chromium uh, alloys with multi-component additions is very complicated and time-consuming thing. So we hope to be able to uh, assist uh, this type of development with electronic structure calculation. Uh, my first result uh, shows, my first uh, res uh, result graph here shows uh, iron chromium alloys and the comparison between different metals. Uh, so here I would like to compare my supercell technique with my effective medium or CPA technique uh, to show that uh, both of them can be applied uh, in the present case. Uh, but very different properties have been calculated, uh, lattice parameters, mixing enthalpies, uh, bulk modulus, uh, single crystal elastic constant, uh, Young modulus, shear modulus, uh, and for example, G over B ratio. Uh, uh, blue uh, uh, blue uh, diamonds uh, show results of supercell calculations carried out with uh, VAS software. Uh, red and uh, black uh, symbols show the results of the CPA calculations in different approximations. And the green uh, triangles show the available experimental data, which we were able to find uh, to compare our results for experiment. Uh, to save time, I just say that, uh, in principle, uh, different techniques lead uh, the results with uh, quite sufficient accuracy to perform characterization of this material. In particular, uh, using a frozen core approximation most often gives uh, uh, better results with, uh, in comparison to experiments. So in the remaining of this talk, I'll show CPA results uh, obtained in a frozen core approximation. Another thing uh, which you have to have in mind uh, to compare uh, theoretically calculated results, especially for magnetic alloys uh, with uh, experimental information, is that you have to treat magnetism properly. Uh, indeed, consider a ferromagnetic material at zero temperature. In this case, uh, all magnetic moments are pointed parallel to each other, so you have perfect ferromagnetic order. However, when you start to increase the temperature, this ferromagnetic order is destroyed. The magnetic moments do not disappear, they do not shrink. What is actually shrinking is the net magnetization. However, the local magnetic moments in most systems remain uh, well defined at even above the uh, transition temperature, the Curie temperature in this particular case. They are dealing with system with well defined local moments, just pointing out in all different directions. And to simulate this kind of system is, is a non-trivial test. Uh, one model which has been developed for this type of simulation is the so-called disordered local moment model, uh, where instead of two component alloy iron chromium, 
one consider a four component alloy, iron spin up, iron spin down, chromium spin up, chromium spin down. And uh, in this way, you, do, you, you really model the paramagnetic situation in iron chromium alloys. So where you have disordered local moments pointing out in all possible directions. And it is possible to show analytically uh, that all the collinear magnetic moments are considered within the disordered local moment at very high temperature, uh, the collinear and non-collinear picture or pointing moments up and down or pointing moments in all possible direction should give you the same result. So let's now compare, oh, it's in Russian, thermodynamic properties uh, of iron chromium alloys uh, with, uh, with experiment. Uh, and experiment is uh, taken at very high temperature. So this is an experiment from Dench, uh, which you can find in Hallian handbook. So if you compare your ferromagnetic uh, calculations with this uh, calculation, uh, with this experiment by Dench, you would see very, very poor agreement. However, if you compare uh, uh, the calculated and experimental results in at appropriate condition, basically uh, experiments were taken in a paramagnetic phase at high temperature, which we model, as I said, with disorder at local moment. You see very good agreement between theoretical and experimental results for the mixing entity, which is a key quantity for, uh, for the thermodynamic analysis. Uh, on the other hand, when you go to, uh, to the low temperature ferromagnetic phase, you see that the mixing enthalpy in, in, in iron rich system is actually negative, explaining the anomalous stability of iron chromium alloys uh, up to 10%, uh, which are used in practical applications. So this stability of iron chromium alloys in thermal phase is very important for us. Uh, and that's what we are going to look at, uh, how, how this behavior is affected by, uh, by multi-component by multi-component alloy. So let's start to add uh, additional elements to uh, iron chromium. Uh, this we can done both the, in the supercell, but, uh, but this is actually a cartoon. The actual calculations are done in the framework of the Cogram potential approximation. Uh, green line in, uh, in this graph shows our base alloy, so BCC iron chromium alloys. And when we start to add nickel, which is one of the most uh, promising elements as considered to improve mechanical properties of, uh, uh, of iron chromium alloys in the generation four reactors. But we see that addition of nickel is actually uh, somewhat unfavorable. It destabilizes alloys. The minimum moves towards high, lower chromium concentration. Uh, and if you add in a manganese or add molybdenum towards nickel, you may have uh, the alloys which are not going to be uh, thermodynamically stable formula, at least at zero temperature. So this minima just disappears. Uh, another very interesting quantity which uh, we can look at and characterize is the tendency towards the spinodal decomposition because very often people consider just mixing enthalpy, but of course we have an additional information. If we take second derivative uh, of the mixing enthalpy, uh, we can look at the tendency towards the spinodal decomposition and uh, we can also see that a nickel uh, Increases tendency towards the spinodal decomposition. So basically, uh, you can alloy few, uh, le less chromium uh, before before the system would uh, should start to decompose spinodal. Uh, well, uh, because nickel is quite favorable, uh, what happens uh, if we add more elements? And uh, this is true advantage of uh, uh, of ab initial calculation. So you can really add a lot and obtain this, uh, this results uh, uh, within the very reasonable framework uh, of, uh, uh, of several months. So you can really, really test a lot of different, uh, uh, different uh, materials or different alloying elements uh, to see how they would affect your mixing enthalpy. Uh, of course, this can be done not with supercell, but, uh, but only with this, uh, CPA calculations, as I have shown you before, uh, they are in very good agreement with each other. And I really don't want to, to spend a lot of time on uh, looking at, 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 at this uh, very busy graph uh, with different aligned elements. I hope that uh, in the nearest future, uh, these results will be available uh, for public. Uh, uh, what I just would like to underline is that, that we did, do see that nickel, uh, the nickel alloys are here marked with kind of a, little, a lot of blue lines. It really destabilizes our system. So it, 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 it uh, makes our mixing entropy more positive. 
uh, but the element which turns out to, to, to show to increase the stability of solid solution is aluminum. And I have to warn, uh, I understand that there are people who understand and uh, work with, with real materials. I didn't look at, uh, at competing phases in these particular simulations. Mixing entropy was calculated only with respect to uh, pure alloy components, and we considered only BCC alloy. Uh, it was a lot. But uh, what we see is that uh, while nickel uh, removes these uh, minima, uh, which was characteristic for iron chromium and uh, uh, did uh, characterize its stability, aluminum actually makes it uh, mix, makes the mixing entropy more negative with respect to pure alloy components. But you can uh, look at more than just uh, mixing entropy. Uh, ab initio calculations allow you to predict and to consider also uh, elastic properties of this material. You can calculate single crystal elastic constants. Uh, and from that, you can get uh, mechanical properties of your polycrystalline materials, like the key uh, parameters for engineering applications, Young modulus and shear modulus. Uh, and the behavior of Young's modulus and shear modulus due to the multi-component alloying is actually very similar. Nickel somewhat reduces both Young modulus and shear modulus. Aluminum increases uh, the, uh, both Young modulus and shear modulus. It doesn't compensate completely the effect of nickel, so if you allow them together. But at least the part of the decrease, uh, and decrease is not very high, uh, can be compensated by aluminum if you add it to uh, iron, chromium, and nickel. Even more interesting is the possibilities to estimate relevant mechanical properties which cannot be calculated. Uh, of course, uh, such relevant properties like uh, brittleness or ductility uh, can uh, not be determined uh, completely consistently from ab initio simulation at this moment. But you may use phenomenological parameters like a typical G over B ratio or Cauchy pressure. So if you consider the ratio of uh, Share modulus to bulk modulus, and it's uh, below 0 0.5, you can expect your material to be ductile. Uh, uh, and the same if your Cauchy pressure is positive, you also can expect your material is ductile. If uh, G over B ratio is uh, more than 0 0.5, or Cauchy pressure is negative, uh, you can expect the brittle uh, property for, for your material. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, most of the effect is determined by chromium, of course. Uh, but if we look at, at uh, uh, aluminum, it actually should make the material more uh, brittle. Nickel makes it more ductile. And once again, uh, the combination of alloying element, uh, nickel and aluminum, they kind of balance the element, uh, make uh, at least the solid solution uh, with respect to pure components. Uh, even more stable uh, without strongly affecting mechanical properties of the material. So this type of conclusions we can try and derive from ab initio calculation, considering a lot of simulations and a lot of materials with a very reasonable uh, competition efforts. Now let me move to, uh, to the final temperature effect because so far I was talking about uh, still zero temperature calculations and I fully agree with the previous speaker, uh, with Alexander, that you really have to go to uh, final temperature simulations to get reliable theoretical data and the reliable uh, properties for your material. I will uh, be very quick uh, in uh, this graph because uh, Alexander in the previous talk very excellently introduced the way how one can induce temperature effects using harmonic or quasi harmonic uh, uh, approximation. You basically calculate your phonon dispersion relation, which here I show for the case of the new high pressure phases of boron, uh, gamma boron. You can, call, uh, you can obtain your um, frequencies for your lattice vibration, phonon density of states calculate vibration of free energy and calculate all your properties as a function of temperature. Uh, for example, volume, elastic modulus, uh, uh, pressure derivative of uh, B prime, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you can see that, uh, that uh, in particular in light elements, this can be very important. Uh, even a small temperature of 300 Kelvin can uh, sufficiently affect uh, the calculated properties. The issue is that uh, this type of approach uh, cannot be routinely done on all kinds of phases because uh, if you take BCC titanium and try to do 
uh, this type of uh, simulations, uh, like quasi-harmonic approximation simulations, you see uh, that your frequencies uh, at, a certain, uh, at certain K vectors are getting imaginary. Uh, this means that your material is absolutely unstable, dynamically unstable. If you have uh, the imaginary frequencies at, uh, at a general K point, or mechanically unstable, if you have the imaginary frequencies at the gamma point, uh, this would be also uh, seen in calculations of elastic constants. And if you have imaginary frequency, you basically cannot determine uh, vibrational entropies in your conventional harmonic or quasi-harmonic approximation. Uh, the approach which allows you to do it, because we all know that BCC titanium perfectly exists. You just have to heat your, your titanium to uh, about 1,100, uh, sorry, uh, 1,500 Kelvin, uh, 1,130. Don't remember exactly, uh, and uh, your material uh, is 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 going to be perfectly stable. Uh, so the approach and the way to, to treat and to simulate these materials is, of course, ab initio molecular dynamics, and that's what you can really see. So if you do zero temperature calculations for BCC titanium, you actually see that your system starts to, to deteriorate. BCC phase is unstable. But already at 900 Kelvin, so below the BCC to HCP uh, phase transition, your atoms are going to vibrate around perfect BCC positions. So you get mechanically stable material. And I will show in a few slides how you can calculate it. You can calculate form and dispersion relations at 1,300 Kelvin. They are going to be in perfect agreement with what was measured for BCC titanium. There are additional uh, properties which can be derived from molecular dynamics because it really allows us to see what is happening in your material. Because your atoms are vibrate, and uh, if you follow yellow eye, you see that red atoms have just jumped. Uh, so you can uh, you can actually uh, look at diffusion in your materials. So not only to calculate ground state properties, but but you really have a lot of uh, a lot of interesting features. And uh, sometimes you get, uh, uh, you get the results which are quite unexpected. So let's consider again uh, our BCC titanium at temperature which is very close to the melting temperature and carry out our uh, molecular dynamic simulations in the defect-free unit cell. So I underline, so now you are going to see what is happening in your defect-free unit cell. So this is a result of our initial simulation, so no vacancy. We all know that the vacancy mechanism, aha, uh -huh, you see what is happening. You see that atoms start to move. So it's a concerted motion of several atoms in a defect-free unit cell, which provides you a new mechanism for the diffusion in titanium. And if you want to do classical simulations at larger systems, so you see that this concerted motion of atoms without any vacancy are very much existing and very much not seldom. You can go and you can calculate uh, your diffusion coefficients. And in agreement with experiment, you see upswing and deviation of uh, your diffusion coefficient from the Arrhenius behavior. So we argue that the new mechanism, which has been just shown to you, which was obtained in molecular dynamic simulation, really contributes to anomalous behavior of uh, diffusion in BCC titanium at high temperature. I have more proof for that. But I would like to move uh, further to our subject presented for, uh, in this study. Uh, one, one challenge with ab initio molecular dynamics is that it is not so easy to derive a free energy. You can do it. Uh, you can calculate autocorrelation function. Uh, but basically, this is very difficult to do in uh, ab initio simulations because of uh, limited time and limited size of the supercell. So several years ago, Uli Hellman in our group has suggested a new method how to calculate free energies from ab initio molecular dynamics, which is called temperature dependent effective potential method. The idea is that uh, you define your model Hamiltonian very similar to your usual quasi harmonic approximation, but you determine your force constants not from calculations and simulations at zero temperature, but from simulations which are based on molecular, on ab initio molecular dynamics. So basically, in, in, do the force marching method, uh, where forces from molecular dynamics uh, and displacement from molecular dynamics should be matched with each other uh, 
for this model Hamiltonian, uh, finding the proper coefficients uh, corresponding for the first matrix. Uh, you can use all kinds of symmetry. Uh, and then your force constants, effective force constants, which are now going to be temperature dependent, and they really are, are determined. Uh, uh, yeah, so here we show another example. This is its zirconium. So uh, red line corresponds to the force constants, which would be calculated by Fermi, by your uh, traditional method of choice. Uh, and they would lead to uh, imaginary frequencies in your form and dispersion relations. But if you do this force matching from molecular dynamics simulation at uh, 1300 Kelvin, your force constants do change they become much more short range and your phonon dispersion relations all become pretty much real. And with these real phonon dispersion relations, you can use all your machinery, calculate uh, vibrational free energy and calculate the free energy using the clever trick, determine the potential energy from your molecular dynamic simulation. So your free energy is perfectly well defined. Uh, and the method has been used for many systems for BC silicon, zirconium, titanium, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and shows very good agreement with experiment in terms of determined from dispersion relations. Uh, the three energies uh, allow you to calculate phase diagrams, and the accuracy can be illustrated here by calculating the phase phase diagram of titanium. So this is a, uh, or zirconium, sorry, this is a BCC HCP zirconium case. Uh, the uh, calculated uh, line for alpha beta transition is very well reproduced in simulation. This is an hour phase diagram for aluminum nitride. Again, a uh, very good uh, comparison with, uh, with experiment. And there were truly interesting cases where the inclusion of uh, unharmonic lattice vibration leads to dramatic effects in simulations of your phase diagram. Uh, these are the results which we obtained uh, several years ago for titanium aluminum nitride, an imported hard coating material, which we calculated first in 2007, uh, neglecting lattice vibrations, uh, which uh, gave a phase diagram shown here in, uh, in this dashed line. And the closing of this diagram uh, uh, of the miscibility gap, sorry, occurs at about 8,000 Kelvin, so totally unrealistic. If you do simulations which now include uh, lattice vibrations with a temperature dependent effective potential method, you obtain the phase diagram, which is much more reasonable uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the closer of emissibility gap at about 2,800 Kelvin. And though it's very difficult to compare these results with experiment, uh, using atom prom tomography, we were able to show that the phase diagram obtained in 2016, which includes the unharmonic effects of lattice vibrations, is much, much more reasonable in comparison uh, to exp both experiments. But of course, the uh, original phase diagram from 2007 is, uh, is totally wrong. Uh, this is an important example uh, which shows the dramatic effect for systems which uh, could have been calculated otherwise. My last subject uh, for, um, uh, for this presentation uh, deals with uh, mixing entropies for alloys with dynamical instabilities, which otherwise uh, would not be possible to calculate at all. And I would like to consider titanium vanadium alloys, BCC titanium vanadium alloys. So you have HCP solid solution, uh, BCC solids at low temperature, uh, very relatively low solubility, so vanadium and titanium, but still not zero. Uh, BCC alloys, complete solid solubility at high temperature, and a large uh, miscibility gap where you have an equilibrium between BCC and HCP solid solution. And we do already know uh, from what I have shown before, but dynamical instability of BCC titanium is very important, at least to describe the BCC titanium itself. Uh, obviously, one can expect similar effects and, uh, and uh, very big importance uh, for the description of uh, the phase equilibria in, in an alloy. Uh, I will start with a relatively simple case. I'm not going to present and calculate phase diagram now, uh, but I'm going to talk about mixing entropy. And uh, once again, I, I, I truly appreciate the presentation by uh, Alex, uh, uh, who presented the conventional way of how we do calculations and how we calculate uh, mixing entities in different system formation energy symbols. So, conventional approach is to take uh, your system, your oxide, 
your odorate compound or your solid solution phase simulated uh, with a supercell. Uh, do calculations at zero temperature, relaxing all the atoms in your unit cell. So this is a green line, which is shown in this graph. So conventional uh, calculations, which are done in this conventional scheme. So first, optimize internal position in your unit cell, uh, then calculate the total energy and calculate mixing entropy from this total energy. So the green line behavior is like that, and you really should suspect that something wrong is here because mixing entropy should not, be, should not behave like that. Actually, if you do CPA calculations for unrelaxed supercell, you obtain this uh, black or red line. So once again, uh, SQS technique, uh, supercell technique, and effective medium technique agree very well with each other. So all this effect comes from, uh, from the fact that you have a, a, a lattice relaxation in the DCC. And you do have these lotus, local lattice relaxations, but they are totally crazy. Uh, so this is a snapshot of uh, your relaxed supercell. But if you do just this conventional scheme, you take your supercell, you put, say, one vanadium impurity for simplicity. You relax your atoms. So that's what your standard, uh, standard software would do for you. But you see that atoms, uh, titanium atoms, are not going to be where they would be in your BCC structure. They just start to move, they, they just start to do anything they could to get out of BCC because your BCC phase is dynamically unstable. It really corresponds to the position of the ball on the top of the hill. You touch it, your ball starts to fall down. This is exactly what is happening in your simulation. So the results which you obtain at zero temperature, this green line, it, it doesn't, well, you have to think what, what you obtain. So this point is definitely not BCC from my point of view. Your system tries to, to, to modify, tries to become omega phase. It is restricted by your supercell size. So it's not fully omega, uh, but it's definitely not a BCC. And consequently, I view and I think that this green line is meaningless and has no physical meaning. Okay. If we now do molecular dynamics and do simulations at 1300 Kelvin, we see that uh, the running average of your stresses uh, shows that the system becomes dynamically stable. And you also see that your BCC titanium atom start to vibrate around their positions, their equilibrium positions. So this is BCC titanium vanadium alloy as it should be at 1300 Kelvin. So the mixing enthalpy of this system has physical meaning. It is correct. It is reasonable. And this is what I show in this graph by the blue line. And I truly appreciate the collaborations with, uh, with Sandy, uh, who took courage of making a measurements for this system. Uh, we, we, of course, we were unable to find mixing entities for uh, titanium vanadium alloys. Uh, and uh, we see that the mixing entity measured experimentally at 1100. So the difference may be partly related to the fact that uh, measurements and experimental uh, calculations are not done at the same temperature, but it's definitely positive. We definitely don't have uh, and don't see this negative uh, deep here. Uh, and agreement between ab initial simulations and, and experiment is, is really very, very good. And just uh, to show what uh, you would expect in, in uh, but now shown with respect to HCP titanium. Uh, so this is basically, uh, uh, my internet connection is unstable. I still, I hope you still hear me. Uh, so this, uh, this is line which doesn't have physical moving, but in the area where, where, where alloys are dynamically stable, zero temperature and AMD results are in very good agreement with each other. So when you are dealing with dynamically stable system, things are okay. If you go to a dynamically unstable system, you have to be very, very careful with your interpretation of the simulation of ab initio results. And my advice is to go to high temperature ab initio molecular dynamic simulations. Okay, let me conclude my presentation by summarizing and saying that simulations of material properties using methods of theoretical physics are highly relevant for fundamental science. Uh, as well as for applications, and that novel methodologies extend capabilities of first principle calculations. Simulations can and should be carried out at realistic conditions, uh, 
uh, and collaboration between theory and experiment is essential uh, for future, uh, yeah, for verifying results and uh, for future progress. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, my emails are shown. Thank you, Igor. Uh, the questions are now welcomed. And actually, I have one already appeared from uh, Professor Andy Watson. There was a slide, I think, on uh, enthalpy soft mixing and uh, an iron chromium system. And there was a note that you compare with some PM measurement dench. So, what is PM? Uh, yeah, uh, PM is paramagnetic. So the, uh, the, the measurements were done at, at, at very high temperature. I don't remember now, it was uh, about 1000 degrees Celsius. So definitely above, uh, above the magnetic phase transition in iron chromium alloys. Uh, so the system corresponds to the disordered local moment picture. Uh, and uh, consequently, it should be compared to theoretical calculations uh, simulated by a system with disordered magnetic moment. So paramagnetic is paramagnetic, and that's very important to understand, because in, in many fields, uh, the paramagnetic and non-magnetic is considered as to be the same. And what we would like to underline now, that these are two completely different systems. In non-magnetic simulations, you artificially suppress the local magnetic moments. So not only net magnetic moment at this graph, but also all the arrows here would be zero. These would be non-magnetic calculations. They would give totally wrong results. So to get right results, you have to include your local magnetic moment and distribute them randomly. So this is PM, means paramagnetic, and it should be simulated using the disordered local moment picture. OK. Um, there is one more question, which uh, comes from Professor Irina Osmanska. And it is uh, to estimate the stability of phases with close values of GIPS formation energies. It's important to obtain values with the minimum possible errors. Are there any approaches to reduce the uncertainty of ab initio calculations? Uh, this is not one question. Uh, I, 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 I say that, uh, that uh, the question is very deep uh, and it contains several levels. Um, yes, uh, if you want to describe, uh, say, a BCC to FCC transition in iron, uh, so gamma to delta transition, uh, as argued and as shown in many cases, for example, in York Norbauer group. Uh, you have to get an accuracy, milli electron volts accuracy. Uh, and these are really, really put very high demands on ab initio, ab initio simulations. Uh, people are doing that, uh, in particular in the York Norbio group, where there is a lot of progress uh, towards achieving this type of accuracy. Accuracy can be achieved numerically. Uh, but still you are going to have some underlying, uh, some underlying issues related to functionals uh, as correctly pointed out by Alex in, uh, in the previous talk. It's a lot of work which is done on the improvement of, of, of functionals. Uh, so we are, uh, we are doing our best to, to, to get to, to, to this type of, uh, of accuracies. But it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to characterize uncertainty of theoretical simulations. This is, this is one of the biggest challenge in our field. Uh, can, we, can, can we give an error bars for ab initio simulations? Sometimes we can, uh, like in ab initio molecular dynamics, but they would be methodological error bars. Uh, the error bars due to the limited time and uh, which your MD simulation is performed. It, it is not going to include errors due to, say, using different approximation for exchange and correlation. So work, it's a lot of work is in progress uh, to get milli electron volt accuracies to determine uh, gamma to delta phase transition in iron is still challenging. Uh, me, uh, I think uh, determining melting temperature of phase transitions uh, 
of this uh, with a one Kelvin or sub one Kelvin accuracy, which is needed in many cases, it is still challenging. Simultaneously, if we talk about the accuracy of uh, mixing enthalpy measurements or elastic constants, uh, I, I would argue that uh, theoretical simulations can provide already accuracy very much compatible to experiment. Um, no, if that is not the case, we should thank the speaker again. And uh, we are moving forward. Um, okay. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Alexandra Navrotsky from Arizona State University, and she will give us a talk on advances in colorimetry at high temperature. Thank you, Alex, for waking up so early today. Uh, could you please switch on the microphone? Oh. No, it's on screen. Uh, no, uh, on, a on a screen, you need to press the microphone button. Oops. Yeah. No. Hello. Do you, do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, very good. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking at this meeting. It would have been a greater pleasure had we been able to hold the meeting in person, but obviously that's not happening. So, sometime in the future, don't know how long, I hope we can all see each other. Uh, what I'm going to do today is use one set of materials or one family of materials to illustrate really several points. Uh, one is the complexity of oxide structures and thermodynamics and order disorder. And two is the reason that we can understand it better now than 10 years ago or 30 years ago really relies on a combination of experimental and theoretical techniques. And in that way, I can illustrate high temperature calorimetry using a set of materials essentially on the, uh, based on the fluoride structure. So if I could have the slides, let's see, what do I need to do here? Um, there is and a lot of demonstration. I need, okay, I guess I need to share a screen. Sure, got this. Okay, and design slideshow. Okay, I think we're all right here. So, let me start by saying that I moved from uh, Davis, California, University of California, Davis. Uh, to Arizona State almost a year ago now. It is our summer, so the other experiment in high temperature chemistry and high temperature thermodynamics goes on in my backyard and in the whole part of the state that's at relatively low elevation. And our typical summer weather right now is that the temperature in the middle of the day or in the late afternoon is over 40 degrees centigrade and the humidity is low, typically around 10%. Uh, this is a picture of one of my dogs in my backyard, which essentially is desert landscaped in the sense that it has native plants and things that don't require too much water, whereas the front yard has grass. Let me talk a little bit more about some of the things that we're doing here and some of the reasons that I moved because not all of you, well, not all of you know me, obviously, but not all of you know that I have moved. So uh, really, this is a com homecoming for me because I started my faculty career here at Arizona State 50 years ago. And I was on the faculty here for about 16 years. And then Princeton University <laughs> recruited me. And I was there for 12 years. And then I moved to California, and I was actually in California for 22 years. Well, what caused me at a fairly respectable age to decide to make a move and have a new adventure? In part, 
it's a uh, confluence of various things, but the most interesting perhaps is what we're calling the Novrotsky Iring Center for Materials of the Universe. Uh, I am leading it right now. Leroy Iring, of course, was uh, the youngest brother of a big family where Henry Iring, the statistical mechanics person, was the oldest. And Leroy was a solid state chemist, basically, and really got the solid state chemistry aspects at Arizona State going oh, from the 1960s to the late 1980s. And those were wonderful years for me as an assistant professor. We had a lot of interactions with solid state chemistry, with solid state physics, with geology. And I visited here about three, four years ago, and we started thinking about how we could bring some of that excitement back uh, in the modern context. And what came out of it is the idea of materials of the universe and the university. At first, I thought I was just going to advise them about it, but I ended up really participating very strongly, and I ended up deciding to move in a way to come back home. And indeed, I'm glad to be back in the desert. This was about two months ago uh, when the desert was in bloom and the weather was not quite as warm. And the Materials of the Universe initiative essentially has two parts to it. One, the realization of the complexity of planets in our own solar system, that even the outer planets which we and uh, moons, which we thought initially were just inactive icy bits of rock, are tremendously active and interesting and have oceans under their surface and all sorts of things. And then the variety of exoplanets that are discovered, thousands of them, really have expanded the thinking about what sort of compositions, what sort of chemistry, what sort of physics. In a sense, the discovery of exoplanets poses the biggest imaginable inverse problem in material science or solid state chemistry. That is a direct problem or a direct investigation is to say, here is the material, what are its properties? The inverse problem is here are some properties, what is the material? And of course, at present in terms of exoplanets, we have limited information. We have something about the size, something about the mass, something about the orbit, maybe something about the outer atmosphere, but certainly in the future and certainly during the lifetime of people who are now students, we will have much more information. So this question of using chemistry, physics, uh, planetary science constraints, astronomical constraints to understand what exoplanets might be is terribly interesting. And it requires, because many of these conditions are so extreme that we cannot replicate them in the laboratory, it requires good collaboration between theory and experiment at all levels. The other aspect of materials of the universe is that if we are going to continue doing planetary exploration in our solar system and eventually perhaps beyond it, we need materials that can withstand the difficult and corrosive conditions. For example, uh, the atmosphere of Venus, the, uh, low, te the low oxygen fugacity uh, conditions on the surface of the planet Mercury, the uh, gaseous planets, all of these at present really, there are no materials that are compatible with those. Similarly, to send spacecraft for a long time, let's say to Mars, with or without people, with or without uh, a manned mission, requires materials that will withstand those conditions that will protect not just the people, but the instrumentation from radiation in space. So all of this is really a materials problem and the need for new materials for aerospace uh, is really a pressing need. Even here, the notion of corrosion, for example, thermal barrier coatings on engines that are corroded if they fly through volcanic ash or dusty atmospheres. These are problems that have not been completely solved. And these are problems then that require physical chemistry and especially thermodynamics. That is, thermodynamics tells you what is possible and what is not possible. Kinetics tells you how fast it will occur. 
But if you don't know what the thermodynamic states are, what the thermodynamic parameters are, you have a very hard time unraveling how reactions might happen. So the Materials of the Universe initiative that we're heading uh, is bringing in new faculty, new capabilities, but especially new collaborations. And I certainly welcome any of you that are interested in it to email me and get some more information. Review this, although the immediate center of this is here, we view this really as part of a global effort. So that basically is what excited me about coming back home to Arizona and we are reestablishing our thermochemistry laboratory here. So having said that, I'd like to get into the major part of my talk. Uh, and the major part of my talk hinges on the fluoride structure. One can think of the mineral fluoride, calcium fluoride, CaF2, or one can think of the high temperature cubic form of zirconia, ZrO2, or one can think of nuclear fuel, uranium oxide, UO2, and all the other tetravalent actinide oxides, or the catalyst material, cerium oxide, et cetera, et cetera. And these have a parent structure, which is really very simple. You can think of it as a stacking of boxes. That is, the boxes are cubes, and inside every other cube, there is a central atom. So this one will have it, this one will have it, that one will have it. Uh, and the cubes, of course, are joined by the anions at their corners. And that gives you the stoichiometry AX2, or for oxides, AO2. Well, this is the parent structure. And the structure itself has a number of derivatives and a number of reactions. One of the unique features of the fluoride structure is that it is one of a relatively small class of oxide structures in which the formation of anion vacancies, of oxygen vacancies for the oxides, is really quite favorable and done quite easily. For example, by the substitution of a trivalent ion, let's say yttrium, into the parent fluoride oxide into zirconia to form yttria-stabilized zirconia, or YSZ, which is a well-known solid electrolyte material and has many other uses as well. In addition, then, one can have different cations in the central site from the cube. Well, again, once one starts doing these substitutions, the simple random cubic structure in which vacancies are arranged at random and substituents are arranged at random is generally not the most favorable configuration, except perhaps at very high temperature. And a very large family of derivative structures has been discovered and characterized really over the last 50, 75 years. So we have structural families based on the fluorite aristotype, the simple basic structure that ties them together. Uh, we have derivative structures which have lower symmetry generally uh, and essentially more diffraction peaks then because of the lower symmetry. And they are due to distortion and ordering of both cations and anions. There are phase transitions as a function of composition, temperature, and pressure. And one can form a large number of metastable materials, for example, by low temperature synthesis, at which there's simply not enough time to get the most ordered structure, by radiation damage, which I'll be talking about, by grinding or mechanochemistry, and by looking at high temperature uh, where some of the disordering will occur. So it is a rich energy landscape of different structures derived from the basic fluoride aristotype. And one can separate the chemistry perhaps into two categories. One is equilibrium behavior, and the other is non-equilibrium behavior. And the non-equilibrium behavior also includes the behavior of materials when the particles are small, that is nanoscale behavior, either when one has separate little particles or when one has a ceramic of very small particle size. And that in turn also affects the thermodynamics. So what I'm going to do now is give you some examples uh, as we walk through some of these to show you 
both what is happening and what we've done, we and other people have done to characterize it. So the first sort of structure I want to talk about um, and the structure that I will mostly talk about is the pyrochlor structure, which is the derivative of, the, of, of essentially the fluoride structure. Uh, and it is of interest, particularly as a durable material um, for immobilization of radionuclides and for performance in extreme environments, high temperature, corrosive environments, etc. And uh, it actually occurs also for a number of optoelectronic and mechanical properties. It then basically is a complex structure and chemical modifications can be made in particular then in terms of composition, in terms of the numbers of defects and defect clusters, in terms of the ordering of cations, in terms of partial recrystallization of glass, many glass ceramics of various sorts contain pyrochlor and zirconolite, which is a derivative for the derivative. And the question then of uh, cation mobility and exchange uh, is a wonderful thing. Uh, cation mobility, anion mobility are excellent for synthesis. Anion mobility, oxygen conduction is excellent for solid electrolyte properties. But ideally, of course, if one wants a unreactive ceramic that lasts through geologic time, one wants to minimize the motion of atoms. So those are the questions. And then in order to understand these, one needs a combination of techniques. And we have been working on this for, oh, almost 20 years now. We were part of a large center, a National Science Foundation, Science, uh, Science and Technology Center, I'm sorry, that was on high pressure. Then we were a part of a uh, material science of actinides, a Department of Energy, Energy Frontier Research Center, which brought together a number of groups to work on many things, including these fluoride pyrochlor transitions. So that work will be highlighted in the next few slides. So. The pyrochlores are then a window into high temperature behavior, order, disorder, and thermodynamics. The techniques that we've used to study them in our laboratories center about calorimetry. We have high temperature differential thermal analysis or differential scanning calorimetry, which I will show you some of. It goes up to 2,500 degrees centigrade. We also have our own calorimeters for what we are essentially conventional drop calorimeters, except they are not conventional because they drop small levitated samples. Our main technique is oxide melt solution calorimetry. And we couple all of this with structural studies and we collaborate with people who do theoretical calculations, particularly density functional theory and molecular dynamics. So let's talk about the structures. The reason for forming these derivatives of the fluoride aristotype is to get better local coordination for different size cations and to accommodate the oxygen vacancies. So the questions that one has, first of all, is are the positions of the oxygen vacancies and the positions of the cations random or are they correlated? Secondly, how much order of the cations is there? And if there's a lot of order, then the cation sites become distinct. The ideal pyrochlor structure is a defect structure. Uh, it can be, if you write the fluoride structure per eight oxygens, it would be A408, keeping the one uh, cation to two anion stoichiometry. If you write the ideal pyrochlor structure, one can write it as A2B2O7, one oxygen vacancy and two different kinds of cations. In reality, the pyrochlors are much more complicated than that and I do not have time to go into it. And the structure though still cubic uh, has these ordered cations. If one compares the structure to the parent fluoride structure, 
The parent fluoride structure, again, is just this packing of cubes. And if one looks at the pattern of cations and anions, one has a simpler arrangement. And in the fluorite, ideal fluorite structure, you have only one type of cation site. In the pyrochlor structure, you have several types of cation sites. Some of these pyrochlors are more distorted than others. And one can even define within the cubic structure the distortion parameter or the pyrochlor-like parameter that says this pyrochlor structure is more like a fluorite. This other pyrochlor structure is more distorted. Let me say something about distortions for a thermodynamic point of view. People often say that a structure is destabilized by distortions. That is not actually true. A structure may be, dis, may be destabilized as a function of composition, but at a given composition, if the distortion occurs, that distortion occurs because it stabilizes the structure under that con constraint of composition, temperature, and pressure. So whereas the material may be destabilized relative to some other composition, the equilibrium degree of distortion gives it the maximum stability. And the purpose of the distortion is indeed to do that. And again, then the distortion and the degree of ordering are the major parameters. Again, if we talk about ordering, ordering is a phenomenon which decreases, makes more exothermic the energy of the material, but the price to pay is a loss of configurational entropy. So as indeed even the last talk alluded to, it's a balance. The equilibrium state at a given temperature for a given composition at a given pressure is one which minimizes the Gibbs free energy of the system and the degree of disorder essentially at equilibrium reflects that. And in general, then the degree of disorder increases with increasing temperature simply because the entropy term is bigger. If we go back to or go to what is a, right now a very fashionable concept, namely high entropy alloys, high entropy oxides, etc., one has to be very careful. One knows that these are multi-component systems. Sometimes the definition is you need five components in roughly equal proportions. But very often, these are contain a lot of short range order or even contain ordered phases. So they are not necessarily high entropy. They may be, but it's actually very difficult to find materials where the ions mix completely at random because the ions are different and they try to maximize their coordination. Uh, and generally then there's a lot of partial ordering in them. So the pyrochlor structure is a derivative of the fluoride structure. And I want to talk about disordering in pyrochlorus. So low temperature metastable samples can be prepared by aqueous precipitation of various sorts. They are typically fine grained nanophase and quite disordered. High temperature equilibrium uh, samples can be prepared and they include basically uh, some degree of disorder. The disorder appears to occur gradually with temperature prior to melting. In some cases, there's partial disordering within the pyrochlor, followed by a first order transition to the defect fluoride structure. And I will show you some of that. Uh, the non-equilibrium conditions then are essentially low temperature metastable phases, materials produced by grinding, materials produced by radiation damage, and of course, composition is a variable. So let's just look at, for example, the stability of, uh, in this particular case, zirconate pyrochlorus. What one sees for a large number of rare earth materials is that if one looks at the heat of formation, the enthalpy of formation relative to binary oxides, in general, the larger the cation, that is the early rare earths, have a more exothermic heat of formation than the smaller rare earths. And this is well known for a huge number of compounds ranging from phosphates to pyrochlorus 
to many other to rare earth silicates, etc. And one gets an approximately linear relation with the uh, with the radius, or for that matter, with the number of f electrons. The zirconate pyrochlorous are interesting in that they, as they become less stable, the defect fluorides phase becomes more uh, competitive, and there are actual phase transitions uh, at the end of the, of the uh, rare earth series as a function of temperature. And these transitions are essentially uh, reversible. So those are equilibrium transitions. So how have we studied basically the pyrochlorus? Uh, we have a combination of structural thermodynamic studies. So X-ray diffraction, particularly using synchrotron X-rays, for example, at the advanced photon source, and there they have laser heating and aerodynamic levitation, which I will come back to, because since some of these order disorder transitions are not quenchable, or we don't know to what extent the degree of disorder remains unchanged, it's really desirable to do experiments at high temperature. And we can do experiments up to, oh, about 1700 degrees centigrade, something of that sort. Uh, cooling curves and laser heated aerodynamically levitated samples give us essentially just traditional cooling curves that say, here is a phase transition, for example, melting crystallization, et cetera. High temperature thermal analysis in sealed crucibles to about uh, 2,500, maybe 2,700 Kelvin to get transition temperatures and enthalpies. And all of these things then go into thermodynamic modeling by CalFed and related sort of calculations. And all of these things benefit from first principles modeling of the energetics. I should say also that the high temperature X-ray diffraction, of course, gives us lattice parameters, gives us thermal expansion, gives us volume changes on phase transitions and on melting. And those are other things that we can compare with theoretical values and actually generally with rather satisfactory comparisons. So let's talk about aerodynamic levitation and essentially laser processing. One of the difficulties in doing experiments at high temperature is of course that everything reacts with everything and often quite fast. So there is no such thing as a totally inert container and that is a real problem. One of the ways of uh, eliminating the problem is to eliminate the container. And it is now fairly easy using commercial levitators, uh, particularly aerodynamic levitation, which is the easiest, simplest, and cheapest. But also, one can do electromagnetic levitation, et cetera, for at least for things that show high thermal and electrical conductivity. But the aerodynamic levitators nowadays, some of them are commercially available, are really quite usable. And uh, we have one in our laboratory. There is one at the advanced photon source uh, in Oregon National Laboratory. There's one at uh, the neutron source at Oak Ridge so that one can levitate small spheres of material heat them with a laser and study their properties in situ. This has been done a lot for melts. Uh, it's been done for some reason less actually for crystalline materials until recently, but here we focus on crystalline materials. And it is also an excellent way of preparing samples because then one can very rapidly cool the small bead of material and sometimes get metastable phases that you cannot otherwise get. For example, in the silicates, it's a way of preparing olivine composition, Mg2SiO4 composition as a glass, which is not otherwise accessible. Uh, so let's take a look at the pyrochlor to defect fluoride transition in one of the later um, rare earth zirconates, gadolinium zirconate pyrochlor. 
It's a reversible transition. So the in situ patterns show that on heating, you go from the pyrochlorine to the defect fluorite, which at least to x-rays looks pretty disordered. And then on cooling, you come back to the pyrochlor. I may say that because the rare earths and titanium and zirconium are relatively heavy atoms compared to oxygen, x-ray diffraction is inherently not very sensitive to what's happening on the oxygen sublattice. Neutron diffraction, neutron scattering is much better for that. And I will come back to that in the discussion of radiation damaged materials. But nonetheless, by doing these in situ high temperature measurements on a series of materials, we have been able to document the thermal expansion, the volume change on phase transition, the reversibility of the transition, and in some cases then as well, the melting of the fluoride structure. So the second thing that we have done is use a commercial calorimeter, slightly modified. It's a Ceteram Setsis uh, thermogravimetric differential thermal analysis uh, apparatus that normally works to 2400 degrees C, but we've modified it slightly to work to 2500. Uh, it needs crucibles. And that's always a problem because we come back to the container problem. And furthermore, differential thermal analysis needs standards. And one of the things that we realized is that there are no good standards above about 2000 degrees centigrade above the melting of aluminum oxide. It's strange in a way to use the melting of aluminum oxide as a DTA standard, but that's the game we're in. We initially thought that we could use yttrium oxide, which melts at about 2,300 degrees as a standard, but there've been, uh, what should I say? Uh, the heat of fusion, which we thought we knew did not make sense in terms of the calorimetry. And that was actually one of the impetus for our drop and catch calorimeter that I will get back to. So anyway, we basically seal our sample in a tungsten crucible and effectively then heat it up in what is a, in a sense, a normal DTA. This DTA works quite well uh, for looking at phase transitions and for getting enthalpies. Again, at temperatures like this, you know, you don't have the accuracy that you have at room temperature or 500 degrees centigrade, but you do have accuracy in which you can get your enthalpies of transition, typically with reproducibility of five to 10%. Temperature measurement is still somewhat problematic. Why we use a multicolor uh, pyrometer for it. We also use a set of secondary standards. So it's difficult experiments. We are still improving them, but we are able to get reasonable results. So if we go back to the basically pyrochlor to defect fluoride transition uh, in two zirc zirconates, and we correct for the baseline, we basically get quite respectable thermal analysis peaks, quite respectable areas a little bit of hysteresis, the transition occurs at higher temperature on heating and at lower temperature on cooling, which is quite normal. The areas under the peaks are quite comparable, so uh, opposite in sign, comparable in magnitude, and we get then the uh, enthalpies of the transitions. The thing we can do immediately having those enthalpies of transition is and the temperature of transition, since this is a reversible transition, the thing we can do immediately is get the entropy of transition. And then we can compare that entropy of transition with what one would get if one went from the pyrochlor to a defect fluoride structure in which the oxygen vacancies were completely disordered and the cations were completely disordered. And what we find is that the entropy is observed experimentally is considerably smaller, smaller by 50, 60, 70% than the full configurational entropy. So this means probably 
one or both of two things. One, that there already is some disordering in the pyrochlor structure before the transition, and I will show you that. And two, that even the defect fluoride contains some residual short range ordering. I'll come back to that when I talk about uh, the radiation damaged materials. At any rate, we get pretty interesting thermochemical data. We have used the high temperature, uh, essentially the high temperature um, structural studies to create a thermodynamic model for the disordering. And the thermodynamic model essentially takes the cation distributions and oxygen distributions that we've measured from the synchrotron diffraction and fits them to a simple model of the disordering. And this is the simplest possible model that says that on the cation sublattice, uh, the degree of disorder is determined from the site distribution. We assume the cations are at random, similarly on the anion lattice. And we then calculate a configurational entropy for the cation sublattice. It's fairly straight, straightforward for both for the cation sublattice. It's a simpler formula for the anion sublattice just because of the number of anions in the distribution and the fact that one anion does not, one oxygen site does not participate in the disorder. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's sort of straightforward statistical mechanics. We then can use the site distributions that we get to calculate effectively the degree of inversion, the cation disorder and the anion disorder as a function of temperature. And we have data, good data for three systems and not so good data for two more, out of which we can then fit using the simple model that I showed you in the last slide what the enthalpy of interchange would be. This is analogous to what we did for spinels uh, way back in my thesis work. And basically we get then an enthalpy associated with the cation exchange and enthalpy associated with the anion exchange. And interestingly, the difference between the different compositions uh, it's a little beyond experimental error, but it's not big. So it seems like the disordering here within the pyrochlor phase follows fairly, uh, you know, follows fairly clear systematics and perhaps these values can be used to predict other materials as well. So that was an example of an equilibrium phenomenon. That disordering is reversible. It occurs in situ at high temperature. There are other ways to disorder the pyrochlor structure. One is by grinding, mechanochemistry, and the other is by radiation damage. And of course, the radiation damage is interesting from the nuclear waste point of view. So this has been a collaboration, essentially, between ourselves and Mike Lang's group. Mike is at the University of Tennessee, and he's been collaborating, essentially, with uh, a group that does irradiation using swift heavy ions in Darmstadt. And he uses the neutron source uh, at Oak Ridge to look at the structures of the radiation damaged materials. So neutron pair distribution functions. He's also measured ionic conductivity at University of Tennessee at Knoxville. And the ionic conductivity follows the disordering and the ordering. We did calorimetry at UC Davis and Mark Astor did some computations I'm not going to talk about. He's at University of California, Berkeley. And the goal is to then the understand, to understand the microscopic and structural basis of transformation upon damage and annealing. And the case study we have, the system we studied the most, was dysprosium titanate. So again, if we just say what we did basically, uh, samples were irradiated in Darmstadt, and then they have to be allowed to cool down somewhat to get rid of short-lived isotopes, and then they're ready to be handled for st structural studies, neutron diffraction studies, etc. Uh, we do neutron studies at Oak Ridge, 
And basically, this is now a pretty well established technique. Most of the studies have been done at room temperature, but a few high temperature studies have also been done, which I will not talk about. We do calorimetry using our custom built and now commercially available high temperature Calvay type calorimeters. The commercially available ones are the Alexis, which I believe Sandy Kwan has. And the experiment consists of dropping a small sample, a couple milligrams of sample from room temperature into a molten salt solvent, typically a sodium molybdate melt at a temperature of either 700 or 800 degrees C, and then measuring the enthalpy associated with the process which heats up the sample and dissolves it in the solvent. And the differences in the enthalpies of drop solution then give us the enthalpy uh, difference, give us the enthalpy of whatever transition we're looking at. So what we wanted to do was look at the radiation damaged samples and then look at the samples that were damaged and then annealed at different uh, temperatures for different times. And this led to a number of surprises, particularly uh, when one looked in detail at the neutron pair distribution function. So the idea is that you start off with a pyrochlor structure, you damage it by radiation and you get a material that is amorphous to x-rays. You can also get a material by grinding, which is a defect fluoride structure. When you anneal the radiation damaged material, you get perhaps a defect fluoride structure. You go back to a pyrochlor and you would like to look at what these different energetics are. This is schematic and it turns out that the real situation is more complicated. So that's what I'm going to be showing you in the next few slides. So if we do the drop solution calorimetry of the initial undamaged and the irradiated sample, we get a very large difference. That is the enthalpy of absorbed by the sample to amorphize it is really quite large. If we then do some differential scanning calorimetry on it, and I will show you this conventional DSC up to a thousand degrees, uh, we get a pyro what looks like a pyrochlor phase to laboratory X-ray, but in fact, we don't get back all of the energy that we put into the sample. We get back about half of it, which means that there is still some sort of damage, some sort of disorder that occurs. And this is completely in keeping with the structural studies. So we did differential scanning calorimetry on the damaged sample. And we found that essentially in a normal DSC scan, we get an exothermic crystallization peak at about 800 degrees C, but that peak has a long tail going up to 1200 degrees C or so. Uh, we would have liked to do more studies, but again, even with the Darmstadt irradiation of samples, the amount of sample one has is limited, so we could not immediately go back to this. But nonetheless, this peak accounts for about a third of the total damage energy in the sample. This whole peak maybe accounts for about half. So clearly then the sample after it's been heated to 1000 degrees or even 1200 degrees C, although to laboratory x-ray it looks like pyrochlor, something else is basically going on in the material. And we don't know if we were to anneal it for months, whether it would go all the way back. Now the exciting part comes from the neutron studies. The neutron studies are sensitive to the oxygen positions as well as to the cation positions. And if one does neutron studies, one finds that in addition to the pyrochlor peaks, or in addition to the lack of peaks in something that we call the amorphous sample, there is some short range order. There is a significant amount of short, of short range order. And I don't think I've got a slide on that. No, I don't. But basically what has been found by Lang's group, and they're continuing to refine the data, is that you get 
a do you get a formation of domains nanoscale perhaps 10 nanometers not more than 50 nanometers more or less randomly distributed within either the amorphous structure or the pyrophore structure and those domains are built on a motif that is another uh, structure derived from fluorite. It's something called the Weberite structure. I'm not going to uh, get into the structural chemistry in detail, but the Weberite structure in a way is an intermediate in terms of disordering from the pyrochlor, which the ideal pyrochlor is fully ordered, the defect fluorite, the ideal defect fluorite is fully disordered. The Weberite has a large number of crystallographic sites, some of which intrinsically contain disorder. The Weberite structure occurs in a number of other materials as well, and I'll come back to that. So what we found then in combining the calorimetry, the neutron diffraction, and also some first principles calculation is that our situation is much more complicated. If we irradiate the sample, we put in a lot of energy, we get a high energy state. If we then anneal the sample to 800 or 1200 degrees C, we get back something on the order of half the energy, but we have a structure which shows a lot of pyrochlor structure in the long range, but in the short range, it shows these Weberite domains. And in fact, the material that is amorphous to X-rays also shows these Weberite-like domains and they persist for a very long time. And in fact, then for them to go back, for the sample to go back to the initial stage, to the initial pyrochlor state, uh, we don't know how long that would take. We have not done experiments that would be a month longer, a year longer, something like that. If one grinds the sample, and this is a separate set of studies that we've done, that produces a defect fluoride structure that has about the same energetics as this annealed radiation damaged material, but it is in fact quite different. The annealed radiation damaged material is a pyrochlor structure with domains of uh, Weberite. This is a defect fluorite structure, and it's not clear whether it has domains or not. We've looked at a number of other zirconates, titanates, et cetera. The overall picture is the same, although the actual values that we get are different. So conclusions for radiation damage. The enthalpy of amorphization is about twice that of disordering the pyrochlor to a fluoride-like phase. That is, if one compares the radiation-damaged quasi-amorphous material to the mechanically damaged defect fluoride material. Annealing the amorphous phase to 1,200 degrees shows crystallization and ordering, but the pyrochlor is not completely ordered and only half of the stored energy is released. And therefore, uh, this is important for nuclear waste forms that one doesn't get back to the most stable material. Weberite short to mid-range order plays a tremendous role in both the structure and the energetics. Also in things like the mechanical properties and the ionic conductivity, as long as the material is partly disordered, it has higher ionic conductivity than the parent pyrochlor. Different compositions behave similarly, but with different parameters. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about the Weberite structure. We've begun to look at a number of Weberites and look at their energetics. <coughs> and what we found is that first of all, the Weberite structure is even more widespread in materials than the pyrochlor. It is a structure of choice in a number of ternary fluorides. It occurs, and in, in fact, it's uh, one of the sodium magnesium fluoride, weberite is, is the actual mineral. It interestingly can occur as a mixed organic inorganic material with some organic large ions. 
and it occurs in a number of oxides. And now we're looking at, can one transform in any case weberite uh, to pyrochloride to defect fluoride and vice versa. In general, the weberites have a different composition uh, from the pyrochlorus, although the overall stoichiometry of A2, B2, of, of let's say four cations and seven anions is maintained roughly. And we are continuing to look at this to give you one more example. Here we go. Uh, no, we did. I didn't. We we have. We're, we're continuing. We're continuing to look at this and to think about short range order in the defect fluoride, short range order in the Weberite, short range order in the pyrochlor intergrowths and transformations. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I did not talk about our drop and catch calorimetry because we have not actually gotten data for pyrochlorus in it, but we've gotten data for rare earth oxides, aluminum oxide, et cetera. So what we do basically is levitate a small sphere, typically a few millimeters in diameter and something under hundred milligrams in weight of an appropriate material and oxide, and then have it laser heated, measure the temperature, drop it into a calorimeter at room temperature. So this is like a conventional drop calorimeter, hot sample to cold calorimeter and measure the energetics. And here again, we just show our little glowing sphere. We show our calorimetric peak, which of course is quite respectable. That's at room temperature. And we show for aluminum oxide and for yttrium oxide that we definitely get the heat content as a function of temperature, a phase transition in this case, melting, uh, and then the, heat, the melt. We're not quite confident about relating these slopes to a heat capacity simply because we don't have as good a control on temperature as we would like. That's something we're going to be working on. We now have a good enthalpy of fusion of yttrium oxide, which we can then use, for example, as the calibrant in the DSC. And initially, in fact, building this apparatus, this drop and catch calorimeter, one of our purposes was to measure heat suffusion of oxides that we could then use as DSC standards in the 2000 to perhaps 3000 degrees C range. And we have succeeded in that. Uh, I would like to close with a comment that we have a thermodynamics consortium that is free to for people to join. And several of you have joined already. And the idea is to just be a clearinghouse and a discussion group and so forth on all things thermodynamic conferences, papers, etc. And we have over 200 members now from all over the world. And again, uh, contact me if you want more information. So to conclude, I want to thank you for listening. I hope that all this thermodynamics hasn't put you to have a nice nap in the sun as my dogs are doing. And again, I will be glad to entertain questions. Just a second. Uh, thank you for your talk, Alexandra. Um, questions? Okay, while our colleagues are looking for, um, there is a question. Uh, Deirdre from Irina Ospenska, are you going to ask yourself? No, okay, I will read. Dear Professor, thank you for the excellent presentation and the opportunity to participate in our online conference. I sent from Russia with love. Um, and I have one question for me. Um, you have shown the DTA for 2500. Um, and uh, uh, how did you reach these temperatures? Have you changed the furnace? Uh, no, it was in fact a software problem. 
Oh, they, so they, had, they, they had a limit of 2,400 just to be on the safe side. They said, well, we can probably run it to 2,500. It might shorten the life of the furnace and so on. But they went in there and they fixed the software for us. OK, thank you. Can one, can one go even higher? I don't know. Uh, we have, of course, of course, our, our sample holders and our thermocouple, I mean, the main limitation actually is thermocouple drift. We use tungsten rhenium thermocouples because, of course, with the tungsten crucibles and so on, we have to have, you know, uh, we have to have reducing conditions. And anyway, we're above the platinum alloy range, etc. So I think, you know, thermocouples are a problem and uh, that they age and at higher temperature, they age faster. The detector ages as well. So one needs to try to do calibration sometimes with an internal standard. If you can put in an internal standard, it doesn't react with either your sample or the, or the container. But it was not actually a calorimeter limitation. OK, thank you. Um, there is a, two questions, one from Alex Pish. Alex? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. I have a, a question about the uh, tungsten crucibles. Uh, you, you, you said that you have a, a protective gas outside, so there won't be any reaction outside of the crucible. But inside the crucible, you have an oxide, which at yeah. higher temperature may release some oxygen and react uh, with the, the tungsten and, and make a tungsten oxygen gas species that that may then go into your crucible. So how do you check if there any uh, uh, interaction takes place in the crucible? Because sometimes you can see it, probably your sample goes out, but you still have some tungsten inside the sample. Yeah, I mean, most most of the materials we've run are you know stable oxidation states. So they're probably not going to give up much oxygen, though we did see some very strange things in some of the heat suffusion that make us, but this was in a different set of experiments. Uh, we always analyze the sample after we get it out. And in worst case scenarios, you know, we see some reaction, we see some secondary phases. I would say that the main way to minimize reactions is to keep the reaction time short. But you know, you never you never eliminate it. Again, in cases where you know where you get reproducible results, and particularly if you can get reproducible results on heating and on cooling, certainly another way when you're doing you know if you're doing melting reactions in the calorimeter, then obviously if you've got reactions with the crucible, you get into a multi-component system and your melting point starts changing, and that's a uh, you know. That, if you can separate it from thermocouple drift, is another way of saying how much reaction do you have. Can I ask a second question? Yes, please. Uh, it's about the drop and cut, the catch uh, calorimeter. How, how do you calibrate the temperature? So we're calibrating the temperature of the um, levitated droplet by a you know, spectropyrometer. The difficulty still is that that's a surface temperature. So again, it's a little, you know, what's the temperature inside? The sphere isn't perfectly spherical. Sometimes these little spheres have, have little cavities in them. Uh, so we've also tried to basically come back to saying, let's see from our other experiments, if we have some materials with no melting points. Uh, we haven't tried to calibrate versus laser power because that's not, you know, so I would, I would because, because that's not as reproducible as we'd like. So I would say that when we're near the melting point of something that we know, then our accuracy is, you know, plus or minus 10, 15 degrees. When we're not, and when we're at the higher temperatures above 2000 centigrade, I would say we might have as much as 100 degree uncertainty. Uh, it's not going to matter very that much in terms of 
our heat suffusion that we measure because it's that different, because the calorimetry is done at room temperature. So the sample drops in and as long as we have the same heat loss, et cetera, et cetera, which is another set of discussions, but we could get the Illumina data, you know, which were measured before, we could get it quite accurately. So that change in the heat content curve is accurate because we're still working on better ways of calibrating the temperature. That's why we have not yet gotten heat capacities out of the measurements. So, you know, it looks like the slope of the enthalpy versus temperature curve is a little bit bigger for the melt than for the solid, which is what one would expect. And if one is brave, one can take that slope and get a heat capacity, but I'm not yet quite brave enough. Hey, and do you have an idea how much uh, heat you lose during the fall? Uh, you, since we've calibrated since we've calibrated using materials with known heat contents, as long as that, I mean, that heat you lose is a function of temperature, it's a function of material. Uh, the distance you drop is very, very small. So for, so for example, since you have the melting point and you get the heat of fusion, you get, and you get the heat of, heat of fusion of something like alumina, which is known, uh, I can't give an absolute value on it, but I can say with reasonable confidence that it's essentially a constant factor for a given set of conditions. And therefore, it sort of comes out in the calibration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Igor Abrikosov? Yeah. Uh, I will reformulate my written question in a little bit different way. Uh, I'm a theoretician, and my question is, uh, when I do calculate mixing uh, or enthalpy uh, at high temperature, at what level of disagreement of experiment I say that uh, we are off uh, or, at we, or uh, we are still in agreement? So is it possible to estimate the uh, experimental accuracy in these terms? Estimate what? I'm sorry. What was uh, that? Like? Estimate the, the accuracy or the uncertainty of measurements of enthalpy at high temperature. So, is it possible to estimate in in the sense for me to answer? Yeah, that it, it might be. I mean, what we get basically, and this is work that we've done mostly with that on Vac Van der Waals group at Brown. Uh, they get, a, you know, when they do initial DFT and then molecular dynamics and take everything to high temperature, which is, oh, an amazing tour de force, basically, they get heat suffusion and melting points that are, you know, that, what should I say, are typically within 10, 20 degrees of what we measure. Now, you know, is that accident? Is that real? And of course, the other thing that is very difficult to say is, you know, what are the what are the error bars on the calculations? And yeah. those are, you know, there's there's all the theorists I talk to say there is no real straightforward way of answering that. So I'm not sure, you know, that I would use that. I'm not, I'm not sure that I would use the calculations to calibrate the temperatures or the experimental temperatures to calibrate the calculations. I would say when both of them are, you know, within a few tens of degrees of each other, and what's rather amazing is the heats of fusion are also within 10% of each other. Well, we're either doing things right or it's an accident. But the more si the more systems you do, the more the more confidence you have. So and that's kind of a little bit of a vague answer, but I don't I don't I, I don't I would not feel confident saying that one that one thing can be used to calibrate another because probably the uncertainties are sort of comparable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, more questions? No. Um, I don't see anything appearing in chat. Okay. 
Um, if that is not the case, we should thank, thank Alex uh, once more for joining us and giving such a fantastic talk. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. And I, th I thank you for the opportunity. And, you know, I look forward to any other discussions by email or individual Zoom calls or something. I think one thing that the uh, pandemic has taught me is the distance doesn't matter, that one can have good interactions with people. And I have been having more interactions with people internationally and with old friends and colleagues and so on, because we have a little bit more time. And indeed, I think a lot of us are doing a lot more sort of, you know, deeper, more relaxed thinking as we're sitting at home. So we may see the benefits of some of this over the next several years. Thank you. Um, we're now going to the next talk from Professor Christoph Schick, and it is Cross and Dissolution of Crystal Nuclear Poly Acid Acid, PLLA, in Taman's Development Methods. And uh, the talk is recorded, but Professor Schick is with us and he will answer the questions anyhow. So. Alexander, are you opening it? Just a second, please. Hello, everybody. This is Christoph Schick from Rostock University in Germany. Welcome to our online presentation. Oops, I have to share my screen and I have to close this. Okay, today, today I want to speak about growth and dissolution of crystal nuclei and polylactic acid. And I would particularly focus on Taman's nuclei development method. The work I'm presenting is a collaborative work from the people at Kazan University, from Halle University in Germany, from Rostock University in Germany, and from Kharkov Institute of Physics and Technology in the Ukraine. So, um, here you see the outline of my presentation. I will say a very few words about homogeneous crystal nucleation and polymers in general. I will shortly introduce Taman's two-stage nucleation and development scheme. And I will focus on the question, which nuclei are probed at the development stage within this scheme. And I will finalize my presentation. So a few words about crystallization in general. You all know if, for example, sodium chloride crystallizes the atoms are arranged on a three-dimensional lattice, and we have a very uniform and highly organized structure. If a polymer wants to do the same, there are some problems, and the main problem is that the ideal crystal of a polymer would consist of fully stretched chains, as you can see here. And in order to go from the coiled structure in the melt to the fully extended chain, we would have a dramatic loss of entropy. Because of that, the Gibbs or the change in the Gibbs free energy would be larger than zero. So this process normally does not happen, only in very few exceptional cases. Nevertheless, most of the polymers we are surrounded by are in a semi-crystalline state. And the way around this entropic penalty is that the polymer chain is folding back and forth and it forms plate-like crystals, which have a thickness of typically 10 nanometer and which have a much wider lateral dimension. These crystal platelets are arranged in stacks, so-called lamella stacks, 
which can be arranged in much larger superstructures, for example, in spherulites. But similar to the sodium, crystal, sodium chloride crystal, also the polymer chain is arranged or, yeah, on a three-dimensional lattice with a typical unit cell. And this, let's say, is accessible by X-ray scattering, the lamella uh, stack structure is also accessible by, uh, by a small angle, X-ray scattering or electron microscopy, etc. And spherulites, because of the size much larger than the wavelengths of the optical light, are also accessible by optical microscopy, particularly this polarized light. So the way how the polymer goes from the uh, coiled conformation in the melt to this semi-crystalline lamella stack morphology is still under debate. And this is something I don't want to touch today, but I want to focus on the fact that each of these super molecular structures, as a spherulite, for example, needs a primary nucleus to grow. And this primary nucleus is commonly uh, just in the center of the spherulite. What do we know about nuclei? Nuclei are considered small particles of the newly developing phase, in this case, the crystal. And for monomeric liquids, again, we have the arrangement of a few atoms or molecules on the crystal lattice. And due to some competition between bulk and surface effects, there's a critical size of such aggregates which are uh, uh, indicating some limit for the stable situation. And that means if we are above a certain limit in the, regarding the size, such crystal nuclei may grow to real crystals. For polymers, the situation is actually very similar. Also here, we want to arrange some monomers on a regular crystal lattice, but as in the case of the crystallization in general, also here we have the limitation that our monomers are connected by covalent bonds. And that means we have a direct connection between the, the um, nucleus of the new phase and the surrounding liquid phase also in the, of the melt in our case. And this causes some additional difficulties and also some particular situations for the nucleation and polymeric liquids. Mutukuma illustrated this uh, very nicely based on some computer simulation. And he showed that even with also along one single polymer chain, there is a chance that there are several nuclei developing. And there is some, then some um, competition between the nuclei. And finally, a very few will survive. And maybe even less crystals will finally grow. But as you can see, one polymer chain may be even part of two different crystals. Good. And this primary nucleation stage, that is what we are interested in and what we want to study a little bit more in detail. Why we are interested in nucleation of polymers? This I would like to illustrate with a few um, arguments regarding the properties of semicrystalline polymers depending on the nucleation mechanism. Here you see a representation of the Crystallization time, let's say half time, is a function of temperature. Crystallization is very difficult close to the melting temperature because of the missing driving force. And crystallization becomes very difficult, as we need very long times, close to the glass transition temperature because of the reduced mobility. In between, we have a minimum in the time or a maximum in the crystallization rate. If we now cool a sample relatively slowly, let's say 10 Kelvin per minute, 
Then, because we have a logarithmic time scale, we see this curved trace here in our di diagram. And somewhere we will cross our crystallization line and our material will crystallize during the slow cooling. What we observe in an optical microscope are the typical spherolithic structures. And you see these are several objects. Each of them has a nucleus, which is a starting point for the growth of these larger objects. If you look on the length scale, you see this is something like 50 micrometers. So we have spherolites with a diameter of about 100 micrometer in this case. We can also have a look on much smaller length scale, let's say 50 nanometer, by using an AFM, and you see the lamella structure of the crystalline structure in this AFM image. Oops. If we count the number of nuclei by these conditions, we end up with something like 10 to the 4 nuclei per cubic millimeter. Now, if we succeed in bypassing the minimum of the crystallization time, the maximum of the crystallization rate by very fast cooling, and then allow the sample to stay here at constant temperature and develop towards this direction, then we will again cross the crystallization line and we will have formation of crystals. Now we can do the same imaging and you see in the optical micros micrograph with crossed polarizers, there's nothing to see. Even we are sure that we have formed crystals that we know from X-ray diffraction as well as from calorimetric experiments. So um, there must be something what is smaller and that is seen in the AFM image. You see there's a large number of small crystals and these are objects which have a size of about, 100, uh, about 10 nanometer. So again, each of these crystals needs its own nucleus to grow. And again, we can count the number of nuclei and we see it's 10 to the 15 per cubic millimeter. So 11 orders of magnitude larger number of nuclei in this case compared to the crystallization at the high temperature. And this has serious consequences for the properties of such a material. First of all, you see it's a problem of the optical properties. This is an opaque material, while the material with the very small crystals, all much smaller than the wavelength of the visible light. This is a transparent material. This is important, for example, for packaging, where you would like to have nicely transparent uh, foils, for example. Okay, but this is not the only difference. Also, if you look for the mechanical properties of these two types of materials, then you see that the spherolytic structures, they are very brittle. So the <coughs> strain at break is relatively small, particularly compared to the nodular structure which we have created by crystallization at very low temperature, where you see that we have a very ductile behavior. So the deformation at break is much, much larger. So you see that it's not only of academic interest to understand the nucleation behavior, but also for technical reasons. How to study crystal nucleation? Crystal nuclei are by definition very small and unstable objects. They are formed by fluctuations in the liquid phase. And that's why it's very hard to observe them directly. There are a few examples available in the literature, 
But this is very rare, and also these are high-resolution transmission electron microscopic um, images, and they do not allow to study the time development of the nuclei. That's why we need some other methods. And it was already Taman about 120 years ago who proposed the following. He observed that the maximum of the nucleation rate, well, the nucleation rate is shown here in red, that the maximum of this curve is very often at significantly lower temperatures compared to the maximum of the growth rate of crystals, which is shown here in blue for glycerol. And his idea was to allow the system to nucleate. By the way, glycerol is a very slowly nucleating and crystallizing material. So he allows the system to form some new crystal nuclei here at around minus 60 degrees centigrade. Then he jumps to something like zero degree centigrade to allow these nuclei to grow to crystals, which you could observe in an optical microscope. This is a basic idea of this nucleation and growth uh, scheme proposed by Taman. Here it is shown now as a function of undercooling. So we create nuclei at large undercooling, then we jump to a temperature which is higher, also at lower undercooling, and observe the growth of the crystals starting from the nuclei which we have formed here. Such experiments we can not only uh, perform by using microscopy, we can also identify the crystallization starting from existing nuclei by calorimetry. And the scheme of such an experiment is illustrated here. It's a paper by Uguni, also already 24 years ago. And the idea is the following. Again, here as a function of undercooling, we have the nucleation rate or the typical time for nucleation. And here the typical time for crystallization, for growth. And now, if we use a constant nucleation time, and we do it at a temperature where we do not cross this nucleation line, we will not create nuclei. If we choose a temperature where we cross a line, we will create some nuclei. The same for run number three, and for run number four, we will again not create nuclei. If after this, nucleation treatment, we quench our sample to low temperatures and perform a heating experiment relatively slow heating rate, let's say 10 Kelvin per minute, then you see the outcome here in this part of the slide. If there are no nuclei formed, as in run number one, then we see the glass transition and nothing else. If nuclei were formed, then as soon as we pass the temperature region where crystal grows is fast, we have a chance to grow crystals during the heating scan calorimeter. And that results here in the cold crystallization peak and finally in the melting. The same for run number three and for run number four, because there are no nuclei formed, we don't see anything else than the glass transition. This works quite well, and this is a basic idea we will follow later on. This was already um, discussed by Austin Angel in 1984, and he already mentioned at that time that it is important to cross the temperature of the maximum um, growth rate or nucleation rate at a rate which is so fast that there is no significant nucleation in the sample. And at that time, he thought that the perkin elmer dsc feed 4 a power-compensated differential scanning calorimeter, is a very well-suited instrument. Today, we know 
that for most of the materials, the cooling rates which are available with this type of experiment, which is of the order of 100 Kelvin per minute, is much too slow to avoid nucleation on cooling. So we need much faster calorimeters, and this is what is available nowadays with the fast scanning chip calorimeters. The basic idea is illustrated here in the schematic drawing. We have a silicon frame, the gray part, and we have a freestanding silicon nitride membrane on top of the frame. And in the center of the freestanding membrane, we have heaters and thermometers or the thermopile. And if we place the sample directly on this heated area, we can use such a device as a calorimeter. Here you see photographs of the real device. On a transistor housing, you see the silicon frame, the black part, and the freestanding membrane. Here you see the same a little bit enlarged. Now the frame is green. Here the freestanding membrane, and in the very center of the membrane is a heater and the thermometer, which is shown here in even more detail. The two thick lines are the resistive heater made from doped silicon. And here you have thick thermocouples, which form a thermopile, again made from P and N doped silicon. The cold junction of the thermopile is here on the frame. So what we measure is the temperature increase relative to the temperature of the frame. And here you see a typical polymer sample on such a sensor. This is a sample of about 20 nanogram, and that gives you also an idea about the sample mass we are using. So, how to study homogeneous nucleation kinetics? As I told you, we follow Taman's two stage experiment. We have a nucleation stage and we have a growth stage. And in between, we have some cooling and heating, and again, cooling. And at the very end, we have an analysis heating scan. And the idea is the following. Here at the annealing, at the lower temperature, we form nuclei. And in case that this temperature is below the glass transition temperature, then we will also have some entropy relaxation. This we can see in the heating scanner one, which is shown here. And you see the typical um, peak on top of the glass transition due to enthalpy relaxation. Then after the growth stage, so when we allow existing nuclei to grow to crystals, we quench again, and then we do a heating scan to, studying the, to study the melting of the formed crystals. Here you see, even without additional nucleation, there's a small melting peak. This is due to the fact that we always have some heterogeneities in the material, and there are some crystals growing from this heterogeneities, which act as a heterogeneous nucleating agent. But as you can see, if we enlarge the time we spend at the nucleation stage, you see a drastic increasing melting peak, indicating an increase in the crystallization enthalpy here during the growth stage. And this tells us that we are really forming nuclei during our nucleation stage. This we can quantify by integrating the peaks. The first is from the heating scan one, the enthalpy relaxation. You see the typical sigmoidal increase and then it saturates when we reach the enthalpy of the extrapolated liquid state. And if we look for the enthalpy of crystallization, we see that just when we reach the end of the enthalpy relaxation, then we have the start of the crystal nucleation and an increase in the crystallization enthalpy. And we can evaluate the half time of the crystallization to understand the kinetics of the nucleation process. So if we do such an experiment, there is a 
question which was actually already uh, asked by Taman 100 years ago, which nuclei are really probed at the development temperature? This is simply due to the fact that during the nucleation stage, we will form a very broad distribution of nuclei of different size. And growth to crystal is only possible for nuclei which have the critical size for nuclei at the development temperature. That means at the higher temperature. Now we can think about two types of experiments. One is if we heat infinitely fast, that means there is no time for growth or stabilization of existing nuclei, nor can we form new nuclei on, the, on heating from the nucleation stage to the crystal or development stage. All clusters which have radii radi which are smaller than the critical radius at the development temperature will disappear or dissolve on the transfer to the development temperature because they are simply not stable at this temperature. So, and what can grow to crystals are only the clusters which fulfill this condition or have larger uh, dimensions. If you think about an experiment where we heat our sample slowly from the nucleation to the development temperature, then clusters which have a size which is smaller than the critical size at the development temperature may grow to the necessary size and finally nucleate crystal grows at the development temperature. Or if we heat really slowly, this may already happen during the transfer. So how can we distinguish between these two cases? Obviously by varying the heating rate, when we heat from the nucleation stage to the development stage. And obviously the first case is a more interesting one because here we know more or less exactly what we are studying. We see only the clusters which have sizes larger than the critical, or at least the size of the critical class at the development temperature. So and this is what we want to do. And if we look around in the literature, we recognize that there is not too much information available about such kind of experiments. There are some papers where people studied the influence of the development temperature on the result, particularly Fokin from St. Petersburg did a large number of studies on silica glasses. And due to some, let's say, experimental limitations, uh, such studies are basically limited to very slow crystallizing um, materials. The influence of the heating rate is much less studied. There is one modeling work in the framework of the classical nucleation theory where Davis in 2001 uh, already asked the question, what happens if we change the heating rate? And there is a first experiment by Shuravlyov and Schmelzer in 2015 the, from the Rostock group, where we used a quite wide range of transfer heating rates. But unfortunately, at that time, we had a badly chosen material. Uh, it was much too fast crystallizing. And then there was another paper by Deubner in 2017, but the heating rate range was very limited, and so the conclusions were not too much. So our approach today is, using fast scanning calorimetry in combination with a slowly nucleating and slowly crystallizing material. And the material of choice is in this case polylactic acid, which is crystallizing relatively slow and can be easily studied by 
fast scanning calorimetry. So here you see the idea of the experiment. We start at a temperature in the melt, so we erase all thermal history. Then we quench at, let's say, 1000 Kelvin per second, which is much faster than needed to prevent nucleation and cooling. Then we have an annealing stage for nucleation. In our case, we focus on 60 degrees centigrade and we vary the time for nucleation and we vary the heating rate when we go from the nucleation stage to the growth stage. And the growth stage is fixed to 125 degrees centigrade and 70 seconds. That means we are allowing the crystals to grow a little bit, but not too much, as I will show you in a minute. Then we crunch down to room temperature again. This allows us to do some optical microscopy and some AFM studies with a particular combination of AFM and fast scanning calorimetry. And after that, we are doing the analysis heating scan to see how many crystals were formed at the growth stage. Here you see a typical result. This is for the nucleation at 60 degrees centigrade for 800 seconds. And this particular development conditions. And now you see the curves for different atmosphere heating rates. And you see in this materials, if we heat very, uh, if we do not nucleate, there's nothing. And if we nucleate for the given conditions here, we see there's a heating, uh, there's a melting peak. And for the slowest heating rate, this is a very large melting peak. And with increasing heating rate, this peak decreasing and finally reach some kind of saturation here at the end. Again, we can quantify this by integrating the melting peak. And now you see for the nucleation at 60 degrees centigrade, what we get. If we do not nucleate the sample at all, the black squares, then you see at very slow heating, everything happens on heating. So there is actually no difference what we are doing before with our sample. And then if we increase the heating rate, immediately there's no nucleation and crystallization during heating, and we reach a value close to zero, let's say at rates a little bit above 100 Kelvin per second. Now, if we anneal longer, you see this decrease shifts to higher heating rates. And for 500 second annealing, you see we have, we need already something like a few thousand Kelvin per second to reach the near to zero level. And for 800 second, you see even at the highest heating rates, there is still some crystallization. That means here we have a situation that there are some nuclei surviving the heating process, even at the highest heating rates. Now, if we nucleate for longer times, you see we increase the crystallization enthalpy. In other words, since the growth conditions are always the same, also each nuclei grows for the same time under the same condition, in other words, we increase the number of growing crystals. And you see that continues at 2,500 seconds and even at 10,000 seconds, we have another increase in the number of nuclei growing to crystals at the development stage. Let's focus on the heating rate of 10,000 Kelvin per second. That is already here in this plateau. And this tells us something about the nuclei, which have already the critical size at the development temperature reached at the nucleation stage. So, and 10,000 Kelvin per second is high enough. You see the critical cooling, uh, heating rate, sorry, uh, for preventing stabilization of the 
nuclei on heating is something like two, three thousand Kelvin per second. So with 10,000 Kelvin per second, we are fast enough. And we can plot the crystallization enthalpy as a function of the nucleation time. And we observe a curve here, black, and we can think about what would we expect to see. From the classical nucleation theory, we know that at the beginning of the nucleation stage, there is some transient state where we start to form some nuclei. And as I told you already, nucleation is a stochastic process, so nuclei appear, disappear, and so on. And it takes some while until we have a steady state nucleation. And the steady state nucleation should result in such a linear increase of the number of nuclei with time. So, and this beginning, as a change from something like a transient nucleation to a steady state nucleation, we can probably see, but very early, we already see a serious deviation from the steady state behavior. Well, we would expect that this curve continues along the red line. So what's the reason for this? Let's have a look on the predictions from the nucleation theory. And for the PLLA and an development temperature of 125 degrees centigrade, we expect the number of overcritical clusters, this is a blue curve here, as indicated here. And you see the time needed for this induction time is something like 700 seconds. And already after, let's say, uh, 1,300 seconds or so, we would reach a number of nuclei of 5 times 10 to the 24 per cubic meter. What does it mean, such a number? This, also 10 to the 24 per cubic meter, means that we have a distance between neighboring nuclei of about 10 nanometers. This is approximately what we have seen for the nodular structure in the AFM images. So you see, after let's say 1,000, 1,300 seconds, we have already a very large number of nuclei, and there's basically no space for growth. So these many nuclei can grow only a very little. And as soon as they touch each other, we have impingement and then there is no further growth or very limited further growth. And this is probably what we observe in our curves. So we have the steady state nucleation and then if the number becomes too large, then we have a space problem and for the given development time, the nuclei cannot grow undisturbed, and that's why we see this deviation from the red line. If we look on the optical images we have collected for these samples, then there's an interesting observation. You see here for 800 seconds or 1,000 seconds, where from the colorimetric data, we see already large number of nuclei. There's basically nothing seen here for for the optical micrographs. But after two and a half thousand seconds and longer, we see dramatic changes. And this is exactly what we have seen as the time where we see the deviation from the red line. So we have also tried to, uh, to look in a little bit more detail on the structure of these samples with an AFM. And you see here AFM images taken after uh, the development stage. And you see here in this image, for example, small crystals which have a size of about 100 nanometer. And obviously, 
as soon as we reach a nuclear density where the distance between nuclei is only 10 nanometer, there is not enough space to grow crystals of 100 nanometer. Okay, what we see is after 100 second nucleation, there's nothing that's shorter than the induction time. Then we see in the transient state the occurrence of first nuclei, the number of nuclei increases, and already after 800 seconds, we see that it, it's hard to distinguish the separate nuclei, even they are more or less separated. But after 1,000 seconds, you see the image changes totally, and we have some co-continuous morphology here, indicating that the growing crystals are somehow merging and that we have some kind of coalescence here in the sample, which finally results in the birefringent structure, which we see in the optical micrographs. Okay, so this seems to be understood. And to check if our explanation is correct, we thought, okay, if it is a space problem for the growing nuclei, then if we reduce the growth time, also we still use the same growth temperature, but we reduce the growth time, then we should be able to follow this linear increase for longer nucleation times. And you see while here for the black curve for the 70 second, we already have deviation after 700 or 800 seconds, for the green curve for 35 seconds, we can follow the linear increase up to 2000 seconds. And for the much shorter times, you see it's hard to see any deviation from the linear behavior. There's another interesting observation in this graph. You see all these red curves, they intersect with zero here at the same time of about 600 seconds which is induction time and which is in very good uh, agreement with the prediction from the nucleation theory. So, okay, this is the experiment itself. So we are able to follow steady state nucleation for a limited time, but we are able to follow. And this allows us to study the nucleation kinetics. But we were also interested in the question how stable are the nuclei, or in other words, what is the size distribution of the nuclei? And for that, the temperature profile was designed as shown here. Again, quenching from a temperature above the melting temperature. Now a fixed nuclei formation for 1,000 seconds at 60 degrees centigrade then heating at variable heating rate to a temperature which is higher than the development temperature and which we vary. And then we have again the development stage with fixed conditions and we look on the number of crystals formed here by analyzing the melting enthalpy from the analysis heating scan. Here you see the result for different temperatures of the spike, also this maximum temperature is varied. We see that for a spike which goes only five Kelvin above the development temperature, there's not much change. We see again the slight decrease with increasing heating rate and you see the stars, these are the data without a spike at all. So basically not much happened. But as soon as we go five Kelvin higher, you see the plateau value here at the highest heating rates decreases. And already at 145 degrees centigrade, that is 20 Kelvin above the development temperature, there is no crystallization at all only at the very low transfer heating rates when we stabilize everything during the transfer. But as we have learned from the previous experiment, we have to be faster than 1000 Kelvin per second to have the condition of infinite fast 
heating. And this tells us now something about the size distribution of the clusters. And what we expect to see is here shown from a theoretical calculation based on classical nucleation theory. You see the development of the cluster size distribution with time. Here you see the different nucleation times. And here the distribution function. And here the cluster size in the number of units in the cluster. Okay, and you see for our case, here let's say the curve at about 500 seconds will be tested. And what is interesting, these curves are quite steep at the end. So we are approaching very fast, very low numbers. Okay, it's a logarithmic scale here. So we plot the crystallization enthalpy as a function of the uh, spike temperature. And you see for no spike, everything is constant. And then we see the dramatic decrease from four times 10 to the 24 nuclei per cubic meter to zero within, let's say, about 20 Kelvin. And according to the uh, classical nucleation theory, we can estimate the radius of a critical cluster for the different uh, temperatures of the spike. And you see that we start at about 1.6 nanometer and we end here at about two nanometers. So you see the variation is not too much. Also, I have to say, the calculation based on the classical nucleation theory, these are very rough estimates, and I don't want to, to say this is 1.6, it could be 0.6, or it could be 2.6, but this doesn't matter. So we see that within a relatively small change of the cluster size, we lose all, let's say, existing clusters. So we have this dramatic decrease of the surviving clusters. With this, we have an idea about cluster sizes, actually the number of clusters available of a certain size. You see here, also 1.9 or so, we have still 10 to the 24 cluster per cubic meter, but we have much more for the smaller ones. With this, I'm at the end of the experimental part and I would like to summarize what we have seen. So first of all, we have shown that the nucleation and also the growth kinetics of the nuclei can be accessed by fast scanning calorimetry. The number of surviving nuclei strongly depends on the transfer heating rate, as that's a quantity one cannot neglect. One has to make sure that one is fast enough so that nuclei cannot stabilize on the way between the nucleation and the growth temperature. And it strongly depends on the maximum temperature before we go to the development temperature. And what is also interesting and not obvious, the classical nucleation theory, which is basically made for atoms, also describes the observation for the polymer PLLA reasonably well. So by choosing the right parameters, we have a very nice description of our experimental findings. If you are interested in this topic, I can only point to three recent publications dealing with the subject. There is the one by Andriano, um, which is just about these experiments. There is another one uh, discussing a, a combination with infrared spectroscopy, an idea which was born in Kazan, but finally realized at uh, Leipzig University. 
and another uh, paper where we combined atomic force microscopy with fast scanning tube calorimetry. And with this, I'm at the end. And I have to acknowledge uh, very helpful discussion, discussions with Alexander Minakov from the General Physics Institute in Moscow. And uh, we have to acknowledge the grant from the Ministry of Education and Science of the Russian Federation within the mega grant uh, program and functional materials Rostock EV, which also supplies such kind of calorimeters. And I thank you for your attention. And as you see, there's always some light at the horizon. Thank you very much. Thank so, you. if you have questions, please ask. Yes, any questions appearing? No? Uh, any questions? Um, probably have one. Uh, there was a slide uh, on, on your calorimetric measurements, and uh, there was obviously we could see the sample. Um, we could more or less estimate the size or width of the samples, but what is the height of the sample, thickness of the sample? You ask for the thickness of the sample? Yes, how high it is, because the yeah. detector is... This old... is, um, in the case of, let's say, heating and cooling rates of about 1,000 Kelvin per second, it goes up to 10 micron. If we go faster, we have to use uh, thinner samples. Also to, let's say, if we go to a mega Kelvin per second, it's of the order of 100 nanometer. So we have to avoid uh, temperature gradients across the sample. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, more questions? Okay, there is a question from uh, Dr. Nikita Kovalenko. Professor Schick, thank you very much for your talk. And my question is about mass of your samples. Uh, as I understood, you... Uh, obtain data about entropy of crystallization and for this data you need information about mass of your samples but your samples are about nanograms so what's what methods do did you use for measuring these masses yeah um, as you said we are in the nanogram range so there is no chance to use a balance to determine the sample mass and we use uh, let's say the calorimetric signal and in most cases we use the uh, heat capacity in the liquid or in the uh, crystalline state of our sample where also in a state where we know the specific heat capacity of the material and what we measure is the heat capacity in joule per Kelvin. And if we know the specific heat capacity, then we can determine the sample mass. And for polymers, it's also very often possible to obtain a totally amorphous state. Then we have the glass transition. And the step height at the glass transition is also, for most of the polymers, a well-known quantity. And that can be also used uh, to determine the sample mass. Mm -hmm. But this is, uh, let's say, uncertainty of the order of 10%. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? No, I don't see any. Oh, if that is not the case, then we should thank the speaker again. And uh, that was the last talk of the plenary session. And I would like to start the recorded announcement of uh, Dr. Konstantin Gavrichev of the Kunakov Institute of General and Organic Chemistry of the Russian Academy of Science about the next conference, RCCT 2021 in Kazan. Could we please start it? Dear colleagues, good afternoon. Traditionally, at the conference closing, we announced the next conference. Unfortunately, just now we can't do it. Venue and dates of the next RTAC conference will be announced soon. In any case, please don't hesitate to send me the message to my email and I answer concerning the dates. 
The second announcement concerns with the Conference on Chemical Thermodynamics in Russia. In the closing ceremony of previous RCCD conference in St. Petersburg, we announced that in two years will be the regular biennial conference on chemical thermodynamics, and it will be held in Kazan Federal University. The next year, 2021, will be the full of various scientific meetings, scientific events. Uh, since, in addition to those planned for 2021, conferences postponed from the 2020 will be also be held. When planning the dates of RCCT, we made sure that it doesn't overlap with other thermodynamic and calorimetric conferences. So, I'm happy to announce that RCCT will be held from 23 to 28 August 2021. At this conference will be a special section on calorimetry dedicated to the anniversary of Professor Lev Dirk and the outstanding scientists in thermal analysis and the first president of ICTAD. We are planning also that a satellite symposium on advanced calorimetry will be held. We are pleased to invite all of Russian and foreign colleagues to one of the oldest city of Russia, Kazan. Looking forward to seeing the next year. Now we invite you to see a short movie about the Kazan. Thank you for your attention. So, where is Kazan? Now we are here. Moscow is here. Kazan is located near the Moscow. It's really close. Just one night by train or a couple of hours by plane. Kazan is the capital of the Republic of Tatarstan, which is one of the most famous regions of Russia. The territory of Tatarstan is rich in oil. Therefore, the petrochemical and chemical industries are very developed in the Republic. A huge number of chemists work in chemical companies and factories. In Tatarstan, the world-famous Kamaz trucks Military and civil helicopters and aircrafts are produced. The population of the Republic of Tatarstan is around 3.9 million people, which are belonging to different religions but live peacefully and respect each other. Kazan is the oldest and most beautiful city of the Volga region, which was founded in 1005. Many events of world significance took place in Kazan over the last 10 years. The International Conference on Chemical Thermodynamics in Russia, the Summer University, World Aquatics Championship, FIFA World Cup, World Skills, and of course we expect an important event in 2021. At the conference in 2021, all participants can not only discuss scientific issues with colleagues, but also admire the most beautiful views of Kazan. First of all, it is of course the old white stone Kremlin of Kazan, the temple of all religions, the historic center of the city, Spaska Tower of the Kremlin, Wedding Palace, Palace of Farmers, Puppet Theater for Children, the main street named by Bauman, the Kazanka Riverfront, and of course the Kazan Federal University. Our university was founded in 1804 by the order of the Emperor Alexander I. University history can be seen in several museums, such as Museum of Nikolai Lobachevsky, Ethnographical Museum, Museum of Physics, Zoology, chemistry, and geology. Many well-known around the world scientists work at the Kazan University. Kazan University has made a significant contribution to the scientific development of many research centers of Kazan and Russia. Since 2010, the large association of different institutions and educational centers with the Kazan Federal University was begin. Today, about 47,000 students from almost 100 countries study at Kazan Federal University. 
The university consists of 14 institutions and collaborates with nearly 300 universities and research centers from 63 countries. One of the structural units of Kazan Federal University is the Alexander Butlerov Institute of Chemistry, which carries out research, development and academic activity in the area of basic and applied chemistry. The institute was founded in the middle of the 19th century and represents the Kazan Chemical School. A galaxy of famous chemists work in the institute. We carefully keep the traditions of those times in Museum of the Kazan Chemical School. In 2015, with the support of the government of the Republic of Tatarstan, a new modern building of the Chemical Institute was built in which the seven departments are located. With the support of the federal program, a many new laboratories with modern equipment were created. At present time, a great number of young scientists are working in laboratories. The studies in the field of thermodynamics are carried out at the Department of Physical Chemistry, which has almost full line of equipment for thermal analysis to solve any problems in the field of thermochemistry and calorimetry. In 2017, at the department, the first laboratory of fast calorimetry in Russia was founded. The head of the laboratory is the Professor Kristof Schick. The Institute of Chemistry has a great experience in organization of high-level international conferences, in which thousands of scientists from around the world participated. Our university has a large number of conference halls, including the Imperial Hall, modern halls that can accommodate thousands or 400 participants, and several smaller halls in the old and new buildings, including the Butlerov's lecture room. The Kazan Federal University is located in the historical part of the city, a stone's throw from the Kremlin. Around the university, there are a large number of inexpensive hotels and hostels that can accommodate all participants of the conference. In 2021, it will be the 125th anniversary of the famous scientist Lev Germanovich Berg, who worked at Butlerov Institute of Chemistry. Lev Berg was one of the founders of the theory of thermal analysis and the first president of the International Confederation for Thermal Analysis. At the end of the presentation, please watch the short official video about Kazan and Kazan University. Any questions to Professor Garbage? No? Well, if, not, if that is not the case, then we're coming to the closure of our meeting for today. And I would like to give my special thanks to Dr. Nikita Kovalenko and uh, Alexander Zubin for technical assistance of the day. 
of a conference. And I would like to thank all participants and speakers for joining us today. The conference is now closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>